Griffin Carson Weekly is here and allegedly has a more productive life hack to share with us coming up in the 11 a.m. hour this morning. Of course, anything would be a more productive life hack because last week's was the opposite of productive. So we'll see how this week goes as we try it all over again. Coming up in just a few minutes, big series. It's a short series, but a big one this week in Tampa. We will preview Orioles Rays. Brian Anderson, Rays color analyst, former pitcher, will join us in just a couple of minutes. And then later on this morning, Mike Bordick will join us. We'll preview the other side of things. No word yet on any roster move for the Orioles. So if you're holding out that Jordan Westberg is inevitable, well, I guess they probably would have waited until this afternoon in order to make that roster announcement anyway. So I'm not going to suggest that that means it's not happening because it hasn't happened yet. At some point, the reporters will be allowed into the clubhouse. And one of them will be like, hey, really, there's a locker over there. Uh, with, with what, with this number, what numbers are you going to wear? I don't think that Jordan Westbrook would get that number. I think there are other players that would get numbers like that. I think Jordan Westbrook would probably get a real number. So he'll get three, maybe? Stan is always very concerned about this. Stan always is very concerned about guys not wearing real numbers. Give like, convinced they can't have success if they don't wear real numbers. Give him Ryan Flaherty's number? Three? It's hilarious how worked up you get about this. It's hilarious. Um, anyway, we'll talk to uh, both those guys this hour to preview that series. Uh, obviously, the Orioles were off last night. I don't like that. I don't like these weeks. I, it's funny. My, uh, John Proctor messaged uh, our whole crew this morning like, hey, do you guys want to get together and play some tennis tonight? Ooh. And I'm like, it's the only night all week that the Orioles are playing. There's one night all week. Oh, tonight. Yeah, that's okay. it. <laughs> I thought you meant last night. I was like, oh, And perfect. like, I don't want to be yeah. the guy that says, like, hey, dude, uh, can we pick any other night? <laughs> Literally every other night this week. Totally fine. This is the only night I get to have the company of Orioles baseball in my life. I would prefer to be at home watching Orioles baseball. And then when I do that, they're all going to be like, they play 162 games. You, you know, you can watch them all. Like, I know how this goes when I say I don't want to play. See, Proctor also knows that I messed up my uh, finger and my toe uh, the other day. Doing what? Uh, I got peer pressured by my kid while we were uh, climbing the rocks. <laughs> He was like, let's jump off this one. And I was, free like, climbing? I was like, yeah, we can jump off this one. We can just not do that. And he was like, come on, Dad. And I was like. You know, it could have been a lot worse, probably. Oh, so, definitely so could have been worse. All things considered. Could have been worse for sure. Big dummy messed up my uh, middle finger. You can see it's all swollen. Oh, yeah, that is a little, oh, it's a little yeah. fat right there. Oh, yeah, it's quite fat. It's quite fat. So he uh, heard me talking about it last night. He was like, ah, why don't we go out? <laughs> Because he's never beat, he's never taken a set off of me uh. in tennis, so he thinks now I'm I'm weaker, and so he wants to try to take a set off. And me. he didn't even know about the toe at the time, probably. Well, I told him oh, my toe, my toe is black. I mean, it's Jeez. gross. Um, so he was like, "All right, let's play tomorrow night." And I, you know, me being <laughs> the the competitor that I am, I was like, "Okay," but then I thought about it more, and I'm like, "It's the only night that we get to watch the Orioles this week. On Wednesday night, we're gonna be scratching our asses." <laughs> I'm like, we got nothing to do. On Thursday night, I guess people could watch the NBA draft. It doesn't do a damn thing for me. Uh, the Suns don't have any picks. They've traded away all their picks yeah. between now and 2040. So I've got nothing. I mean, Cam Whitmore is yeah, a – we'll see who the Wizards miss on this year. I mean, you can care about that, but I sure don't give a rat's ass. I don't know why anybody would. Um, it's so funny how Griffin pretends like he, like there are Wizards fans. Like these are a thing. So the that Suns exists. have to win the f- win the win the finals now. I mean, th- they certainly don't have to. There's well, a lot of other options well. or how things could go. They could not win the finals. They could not make it to the finals. They could. I I, I don't understand. Are they going? Is how many what you're games, talking about? What's how the for? What you're talking about is how they're quote unquote going all in. And yes, yeah, sure, they're going all in. But I still don't see anything that resembles some sort what, of championship caliber right. roster. So what's the what's the over under on number of games that those big four all play together next season? I don't know. Which one of those guys do you think is particularly injury prone? Beal. I think Beal. Durant. I, 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 Durant's not injury prone. Durant. Mm. No, that's nonsense. Durant has overwhelmingly played the majority of his career. Now, how many times are they going to take days off because you know Durant's well into his thirties and they're going to choose to rest him? Probably a good bit. Brad Beal is on that side of his career at this mm-hmm. point. Um, Chris Paul's not there anymore, so that's not. I, I don't think that Devin Booker needs a ton of days right. off, but 
yeah, he might take a day off or two on back-to-backs because that's the way the NBA works at this point. But acting like these guys are all crazy injury-prone, I, I, I mean, I think, let's be fair about Brad Beal's injuries in the last couple of years. Yeah, he's on I think a lot of them had to do with Wizards-itis. I don't think they were necessarily, like, real legitimate worrisome injuries as much as it was, yeah, I could come back and play, but why? Why would I do that? All-star game. Sure. Gotta get to the all-star game. Sure. Why would I do that? I play for the Washington Wizards. Why would I be in a rush to get back? Um, how about that? Brett Beal had two seasons in his career. He played all 82 games. Really? Imagine a basketball what? player doing that. Like, like imagine a basketball like player. Tw- I probably had to be like before 2016. Uh, no, 27, 18, and 2018, 19. Wow. Played back to back 82 back-to-back game season. That is impressive. Now, then there was the pandemic year, and post pandemic year, he has not played. You know, yeah. but, but again, that's when load management really, like in the aftermath of the pandemic, when they sped up to get the next season started, and yeah. then it's just never recovered. Now, look, I mean, he missed half the season two years ago, yeah. but again, I think that has as much to do with wizarditis as it does. I'm not saying none of the injuries were real, I'm just saying I think. I think that you're m- more inclined to try to get back when you're when you don't have a case of uh, I play for Washington. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fair is, point. It's a fair th- point. This isn't this is a money laundering operation, not a basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> I think that maybe makes you a little bit more inclined to get back on the floor. I suppose it's a fair point. So yeah, I did not I was I was very bothered by the idea that we would play tennis tonight instead of either of the next two nights and we have n- nothing to keep us company that I'm concerned with. Nothing against Cam Whitmore, who is – like, that's a weird bit, too, because Cam Whitmore, like, went to Spalding, but I think he's actually more of a D.C. kid than he is. Um, I want to say maybe Odenton is where he's actually from. So, like, we'll kind of claim him because Spalding is in Arundel County, so we'll we'll say, you know, he's he's one of us, but I'm not sure if he's actually one of us or not. I don't really know Cam Whitmore's story. Uh, yeah, you don't, you don't have anything. Thank you. Yeah, I don't Dynamite. Have anything, unfortunately. Dynamite. Appreciate it. I mean, and I'm not trying to say that Od- Odenton's Anne Arundel County too. I just don't know. It, it's such a a middle ground area that like guy people in that area can associate one way or the other. They can associate more with Baltimore. They can associate more with DC. I have no idea which one Cam Whitmore in particular associates more with. But obviously, he played in the MIAA. So. Again, we'll say he's ours, even if he's more of like a Commanders fan for whatever reason. Um, as far as news is concerned, by the way, today's show is brought to you by your local Toyota dealer and by a Toyota.com. The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect on your uh, unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. Uh, I mean, this thing with Luis Arias is absolutely bonkers, man. So he goes five for five last night, and here we are on June 20th. He was five for five on Saturday, too. Yeah, but he got back over 400 last night by going five for five. It's June 20th. Just a quick 10 for 10 stretch. And he's hitting 400. This isn't June 1st. This isn't, you know, we're two months into the season. We're damn near halfway through the season. I was starting to do that math. Like, next week is the halfway point of the season. We're a week away from the midway point of the baseball season. The dude is hitting 400, which is kind of hilarious because the league leader in the American League is Austin Hayes, who's hitting 320. (laughs) The disparity right now. Imagine the guy that's hitting like 360 in the National League and it's just like, I'm having a great season. And he would be leading the American League in batting average by a ton, but not in the National League. Um, where uh, Actually, by the way, there are no, there's no one else that's even close. Ronald Acuna is second in 325 and Freddie Freeman's third at 324. So those guys would barely be leading the American League in hitting right now. But yes, the American League leader in hitting is Austin Hayes at 320 just ahead of Bo Bichette. Um, it, it's an awkward spot because Arias is not is neither a like known commodity for anyone but baseball fans. You know, it's not uh, we're not talking about Mike Trout flirting with four hundred or Fernando Tatis flirting with four hundred. It's someone who even even baseball fans are only kind of barely aware of, and it's happening with the Miami Marlins, who 
you know, just are never going to get all that much attention because they don't really matter. It's like it's not quite the Washington Wizards, but it's close. Like at least the Marlins have accomplished something in the not so distant history. Um, whereas the Wizards have nothing since 1980. Um, but the Marlins are just an afterthought as far as franchises go. So it's awkward. Like, if this was a New York Yankee, then we'd be getting beat over the head with it every day. It's all we would hear about constantly is how I- Isaiah Kiner Falefa was flirting with 400. Instead, Luis Arias is doing it in relative anonymity, unless you're a hardcore baseball fan. But it's bonkers i mean it's absolutely nuts what he is accomplishing after going five for five last night again he is hitting a even 400 for the season orioles rays short but important couple of games down in tampa this week joining us now former mlb pitcher rays color analyst he is brian anderson and he's with us here on gcr brian it's glenn in baltimore it's great to chat with you thank you so much for taking a couple of minutes for us this morning of course, of course, but more than happy to. Uh, it is obviously a very exciting couple of days down in Tampa. I, I am trying to convince myself, and of course the same might be pointed out about the Orioles, that what we've seen over the last week or so from the Rays m- maybe is a sign of a slight amount of vulnerability. Am I reading too much into that? I don't think you're reading too much into it. I, I mean, you're going to be, you know, especially if you're a Baltimore fan, you, you want to be optimistic. I, I think that, you know, nationally, everybody was surprised the, the start that the Rays got off to. Mm-hmm. But I think equally people are surprised that Baltimore has been hanging around. Yep. And so they're going to feel optimistic, and people are going to look at the last week. And quite frankly, the Rays had a rough week. It was a West Coast trip, and those can always be tricky. I don't care who you're playing. Uh, they dropped the first two games in Oakland and really had to scratch and claw to win the final two games in Oakland to, to get the split. And then they went to San Diego and, and the Padres took two out of three. So, you know, a losing road trip, I think that the day off uh, yesterday certainly is going to help the Rays. And it will be the key for me in this quick little two game series. And by the way, we're going to play these two games in about 20 right, hours. Yeah. Because you've got the 6:40 start tonight and the and the nooner tomorrow. Yeah. But the thing that I'll be looking for is: Are the Rays going to come out with a ton of intensity and match the intensity that you know Baltimore is going to bring? Because Baltimore has gotten has climbed within five games, only three in the loss column, and they are going to be looking to prove a point. And so the Rays are going to have to match their intensity. That's what I'll be looking for first couple of innings in tonight's game. What, wait, look, I, I know this is silly to talk about because it's baseball. Every team loses games. But, you know, the Rays have won more than two-thirds of theirs so far this season, so they, rarely, they very rarely lose games. What has led them? Is it as simple as just, hey, it's a road trip, it's baseball, you know, they're, you're going to lose games? Or has there been something in particular? Has someone been cold of late? Has there been something that's made the Rays a little bit more human? Well, I will tell you this, and, and I think that this would go a long way towards any team having a successful series against the Rays. Uh, the Rays lineup is very deep. I, I mean, they've got, you know, they've got 11 different guys that have at least seven home runs. So it's a very deep lineup. However, Yandy Diaz and Wander Franco at the top kind of setting the table for all of those guys coming after him. And, and there's a, you know, I mean, a Rosa Rain is always going to be there. And then you don't know Harold Ramirez, the Isak Paredes, you know, the Josh Lowe, the, the Kevin Cash moves his lineup around a lot, but all that to say in the San Diego series that they took two out of three from the Rays, they, kept Yandy Diaz and Wander Franco off base. Hmm. I mean, they, they really locked those two guys down, and it really kind of handcuffed the offense. They're certainly not swinging the bats as, as uh, hot as they did, you know, the first month of the season, but this lineup is very dynamic. They have a lot of capable hitters, and they've got a lot of different ways to beat you. They can beat you with the long ball. Uh, they can beat you on the base paths with the stolen base. They're a very aggressive base running team. Uh, they a lot of productive outs, so they play team baseball. But San Diego locked down Yandy and Wander, and that went a long way towards them, you know, uh, being able to lock down the Rays' offense overall. So I think that that's something to keep your eye on in the series too. Brian Anderson is with us here on GCR. We preview Orioles-Rays starting tonight in St. Petersburg. 
Brian, um, you know, you bring up that lineup. Is that when somebody asks you, hey, how do you explain just this absurd start that the Rays have been off to? And, and as I mentioned, winning more than two thirds of your games to begin the season. Is that depth the best way to try to explain it? Yes, that and the fact that, you know, the Rays, the, the talk going into the offseason was they need a left handed power back. And they were outwardly talking about that. And so you knew they were going to kick the tires on some guys and see what they could do. And they ended up not bringing anybody in. And I think at, you know, at the end of the day, between the prices of what it was going to cost you in prospects in a trade or money on the free agent market, they said, you know what? If Wander Franco can stay healthy for a full season, if Brandon Lau, we can keep him healthy for most of the season. Mm-hmm. I think we lost Brian Anderson. We'll try to track him back down. Brian Anderson, Ray's color analyst here on GCR this morning. As again, series begins tonight. Tyler Glasnow is on the mound. Well, I don't believe the Orioles saw the, f- the time. Of course, the Orioles and Rays got together for three games uh, earlier in the year, and I don't believe we saw Tyler Glasnow. Which, which, hang on a second. Go, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think he was out at the time. Yeah, I, well, he's only—he just came back a few weeks right, ago, yeah. so I don't believe we saw Tyler. Has he even had this? Game. Is this only? This might even only be a second start. No, it's more than that, but it's you know, it's it's fourth or his fifth at this point. But yes, it's yeah. it's not been all that much. Uh, Glasnow over the years, but uh, has dominated. I mean, he has kicked the Orioles' ass over the years. Glasnow four and zero oh, with a two point zero eight ERA and a zero point eight six five WHIP in six starts. Those numbers, courtesy of Masson. Um, uh, 48 strikeouts in 34 and two-thirds career innings against the Orioles. Now, again, a lot of those were bad Orioles teams, let's be fair, but uh, he has owned the Orioles over the years. Let's bring Brian Anderson back in. Brian, you were talking about you know some of the factors beyond the depth of the lineup that have led to the Rays' extraordinary yeah. success. Yeah, so Chad Matola and his hitting staff, they really challenged the players this offseason and going into spring training to be more selective, uh, to be, you know, to... to not just swing at a strike early in the count, not just swing at a strike because it's a strike, but a strike that you can drive. Now, with two strikes, you, know, you have to protect and you have to go after those pitches. But be a little bit more picky earlier in counts. Other guys, be maybe a little bit more aggressive early in counts. And so what you see is you see some hitters, their swing rates have come down, but their hard hit rates have gone up because they are being more selective. They're looking for a pitch that they can drive early in a count and then protect with two. And other guys are being more aggressive on strike one and strike two. And then when they get to two strikes, they cut down on their swing and look to try to put the ball in play and move a runner or find a hole with, you know, with the, with the no shift rule. And so it, what has fascinated me is the amount of buy-in. You, know, you can do that sometimes with one or two hitters in your lineup and get them to improve a little bit. But the buy-in from top to bottom has been astounding. And you see all of these guys having career years. And it's not a fluke because they really have changed their approach at the plate to benefit them the most. You think about a guy like Josh Lowe. And, and ironically enough, when it came down to it, the final, four, the final four for the last two spots on the Rays roster were Vidal Brujan, Jonathan Aranda, Luke Rayley, and Josh Lowe. Hmm. Josh Lowe and Luke Rayley were the two that made the team. They were the last two guys to make the roster. And these two guys are mashing, both hmm. in double digits and home runs. Uh, Josh Lowe is 16 out of 18 stealing bags on top of that. I think he's got 12 home runs. Uh, it's pretty remarkable what they've all been able to do, but it's all been that buy-in, and they have worked really hard at their approach at the plate, doing better homework on pitchers and how they're being attacked, and you, you've seen what the results are. Uh, yeah, look, I, man, you know, in a very impressive lineup, obviously. What jumps out at me is – you get a Tyler Glasnow back, as we mentioned, uh, fifth start, uh, five starts back, and he's looked really good. We know he's owned the Orioles over the years, but I- are we at the point where we're ready to believe that Tyler Glasnow can be another top-of-the-rotation caliber pitcher for the Rays the rest of the way? Yeah, it's just going to all be about it. can he stay healthy. Yep. I mean, because yep. when he's out there, he can be as dominant as anybody, six feet, eight inches tall. Uh, He gets more extension than just about anybody in Major League Baseball with his reach. And then you combine that with the velocity of the fastball, the sharpness of the two breaking balls. And, you know, he's a guy that on any given night can just go out and dominate. And and it could be a special night for him. He's got that kind of stuff and that kind of mound presence. The only issue with him has been staying healthy. 
I think the most starts that he made in a season was a couple years ago with the Rays, and it was 14. So that's his career high of starts in a season. So, um, you know, health has been a factor. And so you hope that, that he's back to stay here. And if he is, then that's just, uh, you know, a, another guy in that starting rotation that's so strong. It hurts that they lost Drew Rasmussen and Jeffrey Springs. That was a big part of that. Yep. You know, that's 40% yep. of their rotation. And they're done. You know, Jeffrey's done for the season. Drew, you know, we'll see. We'll find out, you know, maybe in another month or two if he's going to be able to, to, to come back. But, yeah, Tyler's certainly – fits right in and, and can be, you know, as dominant as anybody out there. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that it's, you know, is, is why somebody might be surprised by the fact that the Rays have won this many games. There is some similar surprise around baseball about what the Orioles have done. Um, you saw this Orioles team take two out of three from the Rays when the Rays were kind of at the height of their success at the beginning of the year. What impressed you, Brian, from the outside about the Orioles? And, and do you believe – that they are legitimately capable of hanging in this thing and being competitive with Tampa for the entirety of the season. I, I do. I, I really do. You, you know what stood out to me about Baltimore is they've take out, taken on the identity of their manager. Brandon Hyde is a gritty manager, and the Baltimore Orioles are a gritty, tough team. Uh, you know, they, they, they have no quit. Uh, they're going to play hard. They're going to play the game the right way. They're playing with, you know, high expectations of themselves. And I just like the, the grit in which they play the game. I, I just, they play hard. You know, you, you love teams like that. Um, they try to limit their mistakes, take advantage of another team's mistakes, you know, kind of like those old Minnesota Twins teams, Twins teams under Tom Kelly, where they just didn't make it. They let you make the mistake, mm. and then they beat you 4-3 to three or 5-4 to four or whatever it may be. But mm. I just they, – they've taken on the identity of their manager. They're a scrappy team – that if they can pitch and, you know, if their starters can can hold down the fort because we know the back end of that bullpen for Baltimore is extremely strong. I mean, it, I think the last time that we saw Baltimore at that point, Yenier Cano had gone uh, 19 or 20 innings and given up two hits. Yeah. Two runs. Yeah. He had given up two hits. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that. It was funny because Ben McDonald, the analyst in that series, came into our booth and I said, Ben, please tell me that this is a typo. Like, not only is he not giving up a run, hasn't walked anybody, but two hits, he's like, man, he's been that good. So, you know how good the bullpen is. If the starters can, can hold serve, that lineup's going to be able to scratch across runs because, you know, you've got power in your lineup. Baltimore does. I think four different guys, double digits and homers, and they run. They run the bases well. They can steal some bags. So, they put a lot of pressure on an opposing defense. So, there's no reason that they can't hang around all year for sure. And, Brian, I just want to get, if I could, one sort of pitching philosophy question in with you. Um, the, the, we're going to see Tyler Wells start tomorrow in Baltimore, and he's been really good. He's given up too many home runs, but he's leading the league in whip, and he's second in batting average against. Tyler Wells has been awesome this year. But he is already approaching, like, he's only 22 innings away from his total from a year ago of 103. And before that, he hadn't pitched 100 innings since 2018. Um, I, I wonder how much. And, and the other, the flip side being that Tyler Wells is also 28 years old, and he's a big guy. And you know, some people say maybe, maybe you can take the training wheels off. Like, how do you handle the jump um, when you're talking about someone who's right now the Orioles' best pitcher? How far beyond the innings total from a year before can you go with a pitcher? and not do damage that's significant? Like, what do you think is a realistic number of how many more innings a pitcher can pitch from one year to the next? Boy, I might be the wrong guy to ask about this because, I, you know, when I pitched, you just, you just yeah, pitched. If you you just were go, healthy, right? you felt good, you went out there. Yeah, you just, you just went. And, you know, I can remember making the jump my first year with Arizona. And I, I went over, I think, 208 innings. I'm not sure what I had the year before. But, but we didn't really think about that like they do now and limiting workload and, and load management. That, that was not part of the vernacular when, when I played. It, it is now. I get it. But at 28 years old, I think that, that they just have to continue to encourage him because it'd be tough for Baltimore to be in this thing and to take their best picture and be like, basically, you know what, we gotta, we got to tap you down a little bit and slow you down because we don't want your innings you know, to get too high. I mean, come on. Let's, let's play the game and let's play to win. And at 28 years old, you encourage him to take care of himself. You make sure that his routine in between starts is consistent and that he feels good. And I think that that's the criteria. Mm. If he feels good and, mm. and, he, and he wants to go, then he goes. You know, I mean, I, I think that that's the way that you handle it. Now, 
maybe on a game-to-game basis, you've got a big lead. And, like, the Rays did this with Shane McClanahan. Uh, they were playing the White Sox. And McClanahan had gone five innings, and it was a tight game. And he was going to go out for the sixth. And pitch count was, you know, in, you know, five innings, 70 pitches maybe, whatever it was. But all of a sudden in that, in that top of the fifth, the Rays score like six, seven runs. Well, now it's a huge lead. Well, right. guess what? Shane right. didn't there's, go back out. There's your chance. So maybe, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you could do stuff like that with him to protect him, um, you know, and, and try to limit innings that way. But I don't think that, you know, big picture, if I'm a Baltimore fan or if I'm Tyler Wells or I'm the Baltimore Orioles team, am I worried about his, you know, innings numbers? If he feels good, let, let the kid go pitch and, and try to, uh, you know, to try to make it into the postseason because the Orioles are definitely a, a playoff caliber team there's no doubt the only issue being the Orioles have played mostly close games this season they have not had a ton of those big leads in order to try to take advantage of it be nice if they could start getting a couple of those in here we'd be in favor of it tomorrow but I don't know if that's going to be the case (laughs) uh Brian Anderson uh enjoy the next couple days I'm hoping that this is going to be a fun season long battle between these teams and uh, we'll be talking on towards September appreciate you taking a couple of minutes for us this morning thank you so much for doing it Yes, sir. Anytime. It, this, these, this is going to be a fun summer in this American League East, and uh, you know the next 20 hours or so will be a lot of fun. No too. doubt. Packing a lot of baseball in a short time. Thank you, Brian. Brian Anderson, race color analyst, former MLB pitcher with us here on uh, GCR. As again, yes, the Orioles and Rays play tonight at 640 and then turn around and play a nooner tomorrow, and that's that, um, which – I, I think should be illegal myself. I think we should look into that and try to get some investigative units to consider the legality of such a thing, but such is the nature. Also, it would be um, it's different when it's like a series nobody gives a rat's ass about, like when it's you know the Orioles National Series that they always used to be two game. But then they would try to do like two game in one place, two game in the other place, and like pack four games into one week. I feel like with Washington Baltimore it can kind of work. Yes, you can do yeah. that. What I'm saying is like a doofus two game series. Oh, with nothing else on either side. Uh, nothing on either side. And it's between good you like you want this to be a real series. You want this to be a legitimate like measurement for these two teams. And there's just nothing like this feels more like a random double header, you know, like a makeup yeah. double header that they're putting in. They just happen to be splitting it up. Like this should be on putting CBS a few hours. or something or Fox Sports or something. You know, like Why? <laughs> I don't understand it's a big, that. It's a big game. Okay, but I don't think that, like... They always put, you know, they'll put the Braves on with whoever they're well, playing. Well, the game of the week, yes, is yeah. on Fox. I don't know where the CBS thing comes from. I no, don't think TBS. Oh, TBS. I guess. It does feel like it should be... I, this is the problem with all of the national... Like, I, I don't watch... Or CBS. They could do CBS. I don't watch any of these national baseball things that, right. unless the Orioles are playing in it, so I, I don't really... You know, the Fox game of the week does love the Braves. They put the yeah, Braves, Braves on like on well, I don't know if you've heard all the time. they're pretty good. <laughs> like, oh yeah, no, it's not team. Out, it's it's one thing when it's the Red Sox and the Red Sox stink and they just keep shoving them into these two Sundays TV in a row, man. The the yeah, the, it was Red Sox Yankees two Sundays in a row. But I, again, I, I I I should be the guy that's bothered by that. I don't watch Sunday night baseball. Sunday night no, Sunday night yeah. baseball is not part of my regular viewing plans for the week. And Gemstones is back, so why would I give a rat's ass? Now, the previous Sunday, we had nothing to watch. So I, I guess if there had been a cool, fun baseball game, cause somebody could have sold me on the idea of, like, sit down and watch the – I don't even know who it would be. The Padres play the well, – Padres-Rays was this weekend, right? Yeah, That would have been a cool yeah. – see, now that would have like been that, a cool yeah, Sunday got, night game. They never get if new, you would, te- new if you would, Yeah, that, if you had put that on Sunday night baseball – and said, here's something exciting, good teams, young stars, it's a little bit different. I'm not telling you that I would have sat down and watched it, but I would have been more inclined. There was soccer on a Sunday yes, night, so that, yeah. in fairness, I was never going to watch. Um, I would have been more inclined on a week where there wasn't a soccer match on up against it. Is the U.S. match in the Gold Cup on Sunday night this week, by the way? Mm, when is that? Check. Again, check. I get it. It's not as exciting as a normal national team, but I will still watch the Gold Cup. I am... I, and it, it's not like it, it's not like there's nobody playing in the Gold Cup. Uh, which one is the twenty fourth? The twenty fourth Saturday is night. Yeah, Saturday at nine thirty. Uh, that's why? A, yeah, what is that? that is all about? It might. It must be a double header. It must be what they're doing. I think that's what they always do with the Gold Cup is they do double headers because it's not. It's not the full. Like they put them in in football stadiums instead of putting them in a normal soccer stadium, and it's not the full national team that goes to play in the Gold Cup. The Gold Cup. 
Hang on. Who's on the Gold Cup roster? Who's on this? Who's this on is uh, my favorite part of the show when Where we look up things on the internet. <laughs> That's USA my Jamaica th- on Saturday night. Yes, that is correct. Mm. Uh, Matt Turner is on this roster. Hey, yo, so no goals allowed. Uh, Miles Robinson is playing in the Gold Cup. Uh, okay, there's not a whole lot more. Uh, Christian Roldan is playing in the Gold Cup. Jordan Morris is playing in the Gold Cup. All right, it's not a, it's not a very impressive <laughs> roster. There's not a lot. DeAndre Yedlin is playing in the Gold Cup. How old is DeAndre Yedlin at this point? Um, it's it's not. There's not a whole lot happening. Somebody tell me like some of these young players that. I should be excited about on this Gold Cup roster. Tell me someone that I don't know about that I should start to get to know uh, because they're the next Balogun. Uh, somebody explain to me why it is that I should be caring more. I'm still going to watch. Alex Dejas, is he good? I think he's good. Uh, he is good, yes. Yedlin's 29, by the way. I would have thought that he was in his 30s by this point. But normally the Gold Cup is supposed July to be... July 9th. He's about to be 30. He's, he's sup- the Gold Cup roster is supposed to be a younger roster. That's why the Yedlin thing is... Brian funny. Reynolds quitting baseball? playing soccer. No, I don't think it's the <laughs> same guy. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not. Uh, also, it's interesting that they're sending Matt Turner. I guess the question is, like, are they planning on playing mm-hmm. Matt Turner the entire time? Or I, 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 I would have to... This is the problem of me not remembering things. Maybe they always send the top goalie to play in the Gold Cup, and I just... Because it's not all that taxing on them, like, hey, you're you're a goalie, like, just just go just out, stand there, help man. help these guys feel better about themselves by having better goalie play behind them. He did make one kind of nice save in the Canada match on the one. I mean, it was closer to the post um, when it was two nil. He did make that one nice. Always save. Always makes nice saves. I'm, I like Matt Turner. I've never been convinced that Matt Turner was significantly better than any of the other guys that had been in competition with Matt Turner as much as. He just kind of ended up being the hot hand at the time where the, the they had to make a decision about who the World Cup goalie was going to be. So they went with Matt Turner. But I, do I I can't I can't say definitively that Matt Turner is s- a step above, you know, the Zach Steffens of the world, the other goalies that were competing. Um, somebody would say, "Hey, it's a, you're a homer." The best goalie guy. in the world. Come on. I don't think that's the case. But I mean, he's a good one. He, like he's definitely good, and I, he deserves to be the guy because he's played well but tim howard he is not he's not to me shown that he is exceptional in some sort of way that separates him from you know other goalies but you know they did send tim howard in 2011 so maybe they always send one of the top goalies okay Okay. He was 32 at the and time. And the last though, time around, so we didn't know who the top goalie was at that point. Like, like we wouldn't even know because the last time there was a Gold Cup, we were still trying to figure out who the t- who the go- who the guy was from this group. All right. Well, there's that. We've handled that part of the program. We've gotten to the bottom of it. The U of the Gold Cup roster. I don't know what happened. Somehow we went from. Oh, uh, we went from you know the race should be on national na- TV. This should be a national yeah. TV game. To me, breaking down the Gold Cup roster. Dynamite. That's what we're here for. Absolutely dynamite. Steck is going to listen to this later. <laughs> what is <laughs> wrong with you? All right. Uh, today's show. Oh, I, I did the read. I did. Well, I could do another one. Yeah. Stan the Fan, Ross Grimsley, Luke Jackson normally get together on Mondays, but yesterday being a holiday, they decided they would do it today. So today at 4 o'clock, they will help you get ready for Orioles Rays. 4 o'clock today, Stan the Fan, Charles, Ross Grimsley, Luke Jackson, Facebook.com slash Pressbox Sports to watch it live. If you miss it live, YouTube.com slash Pressbox Online or PressboxOnline.com slash video. We will discuss the Orioles side of this Orioles Rays series. Our buddy Mike Bordick is going to join us in just a couple of minutes. That's coming up right here on GCR. The latest edition of Press Box is available now. On the cover, Dave Ginsburg remembers Goose as he looks back on the impact that late Tony Saragusa had both on and off the field here in Baltimore. Plus, he explains how Goose's kids are working to continue that legacy with the Goose Flights program. Also inside, Todd Karpovich profiles the path Tyler Wells has taken to becoming a star in the Orioles rotation. And you'll find a special summer travel guide with information about events and activities throughout the state. Press Box is available for free at over 500 area locations, including 60 Royal Farm stores. And you can always find the entire edition, as well as the best daily coverage of the O's, Ravens, and Terps at PressBoxOnline.com. 
The All-America Senior Game, powered by New Balance, will be back at Johns Hopkins Homewood Field on July 29th. The most decorated girls and boys lacrosse players in the country have been invited to play in what is the premier lacrosse event of the year. Every college coach wants their players in this game, and if you dream of being in this game, you start by trying out for one of your regional underclass teams this summer. The best against the best. Get your tickets now at allamericalacrosse.com. Your summer destination is closer than you think at Live Casino and Hotel Maryland. With an expansive gaming floor and incredible dining options ready for you to explore, your adventure awaits. Dine at the new Coho Korean Barbecue House coming in July or on the patio at the Prime Rib. Enjoy the summertime breeze at Orchid Smoking Patio. Limited time packages starting at $229. What are you waiting for? Book now. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Please play responsibly for help. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call one 800 gambler. Costas Inn has been serving up delicious steamed crabs for over 50 years. Lately, the crabs you want to eat when the weather warms up have gotten harder and harder to get. So get your crab eating game plan in place. Make sure to stick this number on your fridge. 410-477-1975. Call ahead and reserve the size crabs you want. You may be able to walk in, but you may also be disappointed at the size or maybe even get shut out altogether. So call ahead, have a plan, and then arrive on your crab eating vacation. Costas also has delicious crab soup and crab cakes. The Costas Inn at 4100 North Point Boulevard. For more than 50 years, they've been satisfying crab lovers in and around Baltimore. Make the most out of every day in your Toyota RAV4. Available in hybrid or gas-only models. A RAV4 can get you where you want to go in style. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new RAV4s from your local Toyota dealer today. Check out PressBoxOnline.com every day to find daily winners and betting advice from Jeremy Kahn. And if you want some advice about life decisions that you probably shouldn't make, here's Glenn Clark. Back in here on GCR. Continues to be odd. Like, so we didn't hear anything at all about DeAndre Hopkins for a little while. And then he goes and takes a couple of visits. It seemed like everybody was convinced that he was going to be a Patriot, which never made sense to me. I have no clue why DeAndre Hopkins would sign up to play for a mid-quarterback, in, unless at this point he still, for whatever reason, cares more about money than he does about winning a Super Bowl, which would seem odd for a player in their 30s that's made a ton of money to still prioritize money over giving yourself a chance to win a Super Bowl. I, but everybody seemed to be convinced that once DeAndre Hopkins got into the building, the Patriots weren't going to let him leave, right? Like... That's not the way it works there. They bring you in, and you're going to be a Patriot. That probably made sense, you know, when Tom Brady was the quarterback of the Patriots because why wouldn't you want to play for the Patriots? But they don't have a – I mean, with all due, it's not like Mac Jones is garbage. I'm not trying to suggest that he's, you know, incompetent. But he's but played for – He's mid. Like, we, we've got yeah. enough now to know he's a mid-quarterback. In the NFL. And there was a time where we believed that you could win with mid-quarterback play. I mean, honestly, not even all that long ago. It's not even going back to the area of Trent Dilfer. Trent Dilfer wasn't even mid. I mean, he was something less than mid. Um, but even a few years ago, we were starting to buy into the idea. Like, look, you know, Ryan Tannehill's taking his team to the AFC Championship game, building up a big lead. Like, you had this belief that you could roster your way into somehow beating a Patrick Mahomes. But now the era of quarterback play in the AFC is so effing absurd that we don't believe that Russell Wilson can figure out a way to crack through. It's it's bonkers. So to sign yourself up for going going into a division where you've got the fourth best quarterback um, immediately on day one in your own division – You've got the fourth-best quarterback. I, I could never understand why that would be something that DeAndre Hopkins would do, again, unless, for whatever reason, it was just money that he cared about and New England was willing to make it up with it for money. So he takes these two visits, and the fact that he passed on both or didn't immediately sign makes sense. Why, why would he be signing up to play for Tannehill or Mac Jones? But yet, now the news goes quiet again. And we're not hearing reports about other teams that are in on DeAndre Hopkins. We're not hearing reports that the teams that we thought made the most sense, right, like the Chiefs, the Bills, the Ravens, 
the teams that have quarterbacks and look like they're Super Bowl contenders, not the Titans and Patriots. And he just hired an agent, right? So that like, so like that will. But that I thought it was. I thought that was last week. I thought yeah, that was. Right. Be- but that was before the visits. Like he's yeah, taking yeah. visits. And now and like, nothing. Well, like, I mean, yeah, like maybe something will come out again in like another week or two. I guess. I, I would. I would think that at some point somebody's going to sign yeah. DeAndre Hopkins. Yes. No, but I it's mean we- that. My know, point is that it's are interested. Like, that's fine, but it's weird that there was interest to start taking visits, and now it's just gone silent again. That's weird. It's not because he changed agents. He took visits. Like there was interest in DeAndre Hopkins. He went on the road. He did the tour. And now he's done the tour, and it's just gone radio silent once more. Especially right now, because you'd think that this would be a great story for a lot of people. Like, you'd think there'd be a lot of talk about this, because this is kind of like, there's there's nothing nothing else else to talk talk about. Well, that's why it got so much attention. Yeah, like, you'd think that people would just be sitting there all day and still speculating about it, but it's not happening. Despite the fact that it made no sense for him to sign with the Patriots, it's all that anybody was talking about for a couple of days, because, you know, he was on a visit. And he's the guy that's available. I saw something where Dalvin Cook was was throwing out the idea of them signing together somewhere, like sort of trying to create some sort of NBA Big Three scenario. I, I, I don't, I, I don't think the team exists that has that type of money. I don't think that's a possibility at all. And I also don't know which team. I mean, I guess the Chiefs could make sense in a scenario like that. But like, the Chiefs have shown you can. I mean, I'm not saying that yes, Pacheco's you, mid, but you can no, Pacheco, definitely. You can, Pacheco you, showed something beyond. But you can win with a mid running back, though. Um, I. That's a whole other discussion. It but. is a whole other discussion, right? And I have to think about who would fit into that category of who did win with a mid running. That back. That was just like, like a system player. You could. I, I mean, that's a that's a tough. That is a tough. That's a whole other can of worms. Yeah, it's so. a tough conversation. Um, but, yes, to the point, I don't know which of these teams that's interested in DeAndre Hopkins would also be prioritizing Dalvin Cook. Because so then they have some serious holes to address. So they're and if I'm DeAndre, not ready to win. If I'm DeAndre Hopkins, I'm not letting that I- impact at all. Like, the nope. idea that Dalvin Cook wants to form, like, hey, cool, man. I'm just going to go try to win a Super Bowl. You do your yeah, thing. I'll go sign with a team that's already ready to win that already yes. has someone yes. almost you, as you, good as you. You do whatever you want to do. I'm going to concern myself trying to win a Super Bowl. I'm, I'm not trying to suggest there's some sort of conspiracy at, at, afoot, but – I, I just feel like I feel like there should be more news about DeAndre Hopkins after he took his first two visits. Let's uh, get back to the Orioles. Again, they open up a series against the Rays. Joining us now from Baltimore Baseball tonight on 105.7 The Fan and, of course, League of Dreams and Baseball Warehouse. He is our buddy Mike Bordick, and he's back with us now here on GCR. Mike, it's Glenn. It's always good to catch you up. Thank you for taking a couple of minutes for us this morning. Absolutely, Glenn. How you doing, man? I'm good, buddy. Um, I, I feel like we're in this weird place, Mike, where everyone is clamoring about Jordan Westberg and, to some extent, Colton Cowser as well. The Orioles have continued to stay afloat, but, you know, they have lost four of their last seven series. The offense has been, you know, hit or miss, I think is a fair way to describe it. And when you're trying to compete with the Rays, who have a five-game lead – I can kind of understand why there is a, a desire for more of an offensive punch and for someone to try to come in. Do you feel like it's approaching time for the Orioles to try to do something different to ignite the offense a little bit? Oh, wow. You know, I, I don't know that you want to move too many pieces right now. I, I think if you – if you end up biting the bullet and bringing up those players that you mentioned, then somebody else has to uh, go away. I, I think, um, you know, they've done a really good job, even though they've had to make a lot of moves already this year, with the players that they've brought up. And I, I think uh, Aaron Hicks is doing a really good job right now, filling in for Cedric Mullins. O'Hearn has been outstanding, right, uh, filling in for uh, Mountcastle and wherever they put him. So, you know, I think the guys are doing a good enough job. I do agree that the offense has been a little sporadic. Um, but I think they're playing some pretty good baseball. You know, it's still a really solid defensive team. Austin Hayes continues to be a beast out there in left field. Uh, top hitter right now in, in the American League. Yep. So, you know, there, there are a lot of good things happening for this team. I, I just don't. I think the Orioles have played themselves in a position where us as fans now just want keep wanting more. 
we, we want more sure. good stuff. Sure. Keep it, keep it coming. They're playing great baseball. Listen, it's a long season, and they're going to be these ups and downs. And I just think there's a little bit of a downtime right now. And to be honest with you, it's not that bad. Uh, I still think they're playing good baseball. Their pitching has been outstanding, starting pitchers especially. Um, and, you know, now's the time to maybe play the Rays because the Rays aren't doing too well either. I think they're 5-5 five and five yeah. in their last 10. Yeah. So um, hopefully it's a good series, two short two-game series down there, and the Orioles can get right back on track. Yeah, they had a tough trip to the West. Um, I, Mike, what – I. It's not a singular accomplishment to say we haven't been swept, right? Like, that alone does not get you anything. Uh, if you lose two out of three in every series for a season, you're going to be a very bad baseball team. But it, it yeah. does feel like it matters in some sort of way. That It's not just for the season the Orioles haven't been swept. It's since Adley Rutschman arrived the Orioles haven't been swept. How do you explain what meaning, if any, there is for a team that has avoided being swept for now over a calendar year? I think there's a lot to it. I mean, I think it really kind of describes this team and shows the character of this team. Um, yeah, they want to win series, absolutely, but they're never willing to fold the tent up and say, ah, oh, this, you know, this other team is playing Come back to win so many games this season. They haven't, you know, been swept. I think it's the team to win every. I think they have great pieces that can do that. Different. Um, there's not really one guy. Mm, let's see if we can't uh, get them. Uh, it might just be a rough patch of road. It sounds like he's in his car. Mike Bordick with us here. One of those weird days where uh, technology is uh, just n just our enemy today. Uh, Mike Bordick with us as we are getting ready for Orioles Rays, the first of a two-game set tonight at 640, and then game two tomorrow just after noon. As, uh, then after that, the Orioles return home this weekend. Let's try Mike again. Um, Mike, no, I, I agree with you. It, it is, like, they, they for whatever reason, it, like, they, they don't, nothing stays with them for too long. Like, no one loss or two losses turn into the type of thing that, that sends them into a spiral I think it's a, it is a testament about their leadership. It's a testament about their culture that it plays out that way. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, we talked about Adley Rutschman being that kind of spearhead and the foundation, I think, to that kind of mentality, you know, and then the pieces that are around him um, really step up. I think everybody are, has contributed, right, to their success. So, you know, just when all of a sudden somebody starts uh, – you know, maybe taking an over in a series, somebody else picks up the pace. I mean, look, I think the arrival of Aaron Hicks has been, you know, very notable. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that here's a guy on his last leg just hanging on. Next thing you know, he comes into this clubhouse where there's an incredible amount of energy, a great belief that their uh, best team in the American League East, second best record in all of baseball, and, and they're going to go out there and compete. And that rubs off on everybody. I mean, O'Hearn's kind of drank that water. Uh, Hicks is drinking that water. I, I think uh, it's just part of their makeup right now just to never say die and go out and compete to win on a nightly basis. Uh, that's what really kind of makes them so much fun to watch. And even when they're behind, I think we all feel like, you know, something special is going to happen and they're going to find a way to come back and win, ball, win a ball game. So uh, it, it's been a lot of fun. I, I just think it's uh, – what they've built now, what Brandon Hyde has helped build and instill in a lot of these players, um, it's a, just a belief in themselves that they can compete and be one of the better teams in, in the American League East. Mike Bordick with us here on GCR. Mike, as, as we talk about maybe not, you know, hey, this is baseball and sometimes you lose a game and you don't overreact to things, they're still a good baseball team. It feels like you, you can't ever suggest that any particular game you play in a 162-game season is all that much more important than any of the other ones because it's 162 games. But being five games back of the Rays and knowing it's it's no longer the unbalanced schedule and you get a ton of games, it, it does there feel like there's a sense, a, signi a, more, a greater significance tonight and tomorrow for these games knowing that there's only so many chances you have this year head-to-head -head against a team like the Rays in order to try to help close that gap? I think they feel that. 
I, I think, yeah, the players that uh, are competing in the American League East, which is hands down the best um, division in all of baseball, when they go up against their division rivals, no matter who it is, um, you know, they're going to feel like they got to play their best brand of baseball. they got to get up, and everybody's got to be on their toes. They pay a little bit more attention to detail. Not that they, this team, you know, lacks that kind of focus and attention, but they know the importance of these games, and every game has incredible meaning. Um, and I think they got a taste of that because of last year. Uh, they were so close to making it to the postseason, they could look back and say, man, if we would have been able to pull that game out or that game out, we might have been in the postseason last year. Mm-hmm. So they know how important every game is and why they go at it the way they do. So the Orioles don't need a fifth starter until next Tuesday, given the uh, two days off this week. Cole Irvin looked pretty good for his first start, obviously was a mess in Chicago on Friday. Meanwhile, Grayson Rodriguez has pitched pretty well down at AAA. How much longer? It, it sort of feels like it's a difficult thing. Like, we know that Grayson needed to go down because it, it just – there were things that weren't working. But there's also some argument to, hey, if, if he's got a limited amount of innings, how many do you really want him throwing at AAA? What do you do when you need a fifth starter next Tuesday? Do you keep with Irvin or – do you go right back to Grayson and say, hey, we, we need him to figure it out here. We need him to be able to do this at the major league level. Yeah, that's uh, that's risky proposition right there. I, I think you'd like him to just uh, hone in a little bit better um, so and just kind of prove um, that he's more consistent with his mental approach, um, his command just a little bit better. Uh, but I know Irvin's a little, been a little bit shaky as well. I mean, mm-hmm. they're not going to put up with him going out there and having a flop start again. Um, he's somebody that I anticipated having a strong year. Right. I, I thought he was going to be exceptional, and he still could. You know, he could have a very strong second half. I think uh, the Orioles starters notoriously are, are better the second half. At least a few of them were last year, and they've continued to ride a nice wave. Uh, Bradish and, and Kramer uh, right off the top. So, you know, I think Irvin could potentially settle in and, and be a huge contributor. It would be nice. I think the Orioles would feel a lot better about the whole situation if he could. Just give him, uh, get in the middle of ball games, give him chances to win like the rest of the starters are doing right now. Um, but I'll tell you what, if, if he shows inconsistency, it wouldn't surprise me that they take another chance. I'm bringing Grayson up. I mean, uh, and that's the beauty, I guess, of the depth of the organization. They do have other arms that they could possibly look at as well. So, um, and I think the Orioles are kind of proving that depth is so important and uh, where a lot of teams just don't have it to kind of cover. So, uh, yeah, the Orioles got a lot of good weapons to work with. I don't think they're, um, you know, incredibly concerned right now because I think they do have arms. But they'd love to have one of those guys just step up and say, I want to be the fifth starter, and I can, you can count on me um, every fifth day. Mike, how do you describe what, uh, what's changed with Gunnar Henderson and how he, over the last couple of weeks, has turned into the man that we all believe? I say man. He's, he's what he's about. I think today he turns 22. <laughs> um, uh, the, the player <laughs> that we all believed that he was going to be when he got called up. Yeah, it's just the repetitions, and I also think it's just being in that clubhouse. Uh, you got great uh, young pros, Adley Rutschman, um, you know, probably giving them uh, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, some of the experienced players, uh, Anthony Santander, Arias, and, and now Hicks there in the clubhouse. He's got a lot of good uh, teammates to lean on and help him through, you know, the tough times, and that's typically where most players go when they're struggling sure they'll lean on a coach to to some point but in a lot of cases you know the coaches aren't in there in the batter's box they, they're they not going through you know the highs and lows and having to face a guy with a 95 mile an hour fastball and a ridiculous mm-hmm. slider on a nightly basis so it's the teammates that I think a lot of times players rely on and I think you know right back to that team chemistry I think he's his, his teammates have helped him through this and, and trusted him and, and kept giving him the positive reinforcement, belief that, that he has it. And, you know, it started in a slow, kind of inconspicuous way. He got like a blue pip one night, and then the next night he rolled one through. And then the next night he rolled one through. And all of a sudden he had 
a five-game hitting streak with only like five hits, I think it was. And it's that kind of slow confidence that, that built into uh, now <laughs> the guy that we're talking about being Rookie of the Year again. Yep. And, and looking at him and saying, wow, he does have MVP kind of stuff. I mean, he's such a great talent, you know, that as soon as that confidence kind of took over and every player has to go through – the failure at the major league level and find ways, learn ways to work themselves out and through those kind of situations. And the hope is because every player is going to do it, even the great ones have their ups and downs, but uh, keeping those down times a little bit shorter um, throughout the rest of his career. How do you explain somebody hitting 400 on, on June 20th? Should, should we all be like stopping everything we're doing and just watching <laughs> every Marlins game at this point? Because it feels it feels like this somehow is not getting – like, if a Yankee was doing this, it's all we'd ever hear about, right? Like, it, Luis Arias is exactly. hitting 400 on June 20th. It feels like it should be all we're discussing in the world of sports. Oh, no, and we'll be talking about it. I'll tell you what, if he keeps this up uh, after the All-Star break, um, we'll definitely be talking about it. And Miami is no, uh, no slouch. You right. see them probably in the postseason, so we'll be talking about it even more. Um, you know, the, the, the kid can hit, right? I mean, he was doing the same thing with Minnesota. So yep. I think it's pretty impressive, though. Hasn't he got five yeah, and two or of three five-hit games this And two, two of his last three games were five-hit games. It's bonkers, man. Yeah. It's, it's just un- unbelievable. It's bonkers. Yeah, so uh, it's, you know what I think is cool in this day and age of, you know, where the high strikeouts are still somewhat acceptable and the, and the home run ball is, is just all they want. Uh, just a, a hitter, you know, a guy that knows how to put the barrel on the ball, use the whole field, um, not really a home run threat, but uh, just knows how to hit, man. And the, the value to that, I think, is so important. It frustrates pitchers um, and extends innings. Uh, I, I just love to watch it. I love to watch the high batting average guys go about their business. And, and it's great to see a, a pure hitter um, still at the major league level. Mike Bordick, what all can I plug for you, my friends? Oh, well, you know the League of Dreams is near and dear to my heart, and we continue to uh, do great things. So excited about the summer, excited about uh, some of the upcoming events that that we put on. I encourage everybody to check out theleagueofdreams.org. We we are on social media now as well. So it's fun to watch. It's very inspiring, and uh, we hope to continue to do great things. And obviously the baseball warehouse, we're starting our summer clinics. Uh, We're all over the place. We're up in Pennsylvania. We're doing one up in Hanover. We're up in Harrisburg. Uh, So check it out. If you want to give your kid a great opportunity to learn from some pros, uh, check out the baseball warehouse. And, of course, Alloy Sports. Still plugging away, man. Homegrown, uh, you know, startup company. Yep. Um, Looking to build research and and help people – enhance their betting game for sure so yeah a lot of great things going on uh loving this time of year at m bordick on twitter baltimore baseball tonight on 105.7 the fan mike bordick always appreciate you sir we'll talk to you real soon all right sounds good glenn thank you mike bordick with us here on gcr well indeed as expected the orioles have made roster moves today We all thought today might be the day, and indeed, today is the day. The Orioles have made multiple roster moves. Anthony Bemboom is back, baby! He's back! Jose Godoy, we barely knew you. They've been playing uh, musical backup catchers in Baltimore for the last week. Backup, backup catcher. Backup, well, I mean, yes, I guess that's true. Right now, he's the only backup catcher because McCann is hurt. Oh, that's right. Um, You're right. Yes. Uh, is he day-to-day or is he? No, he went on the oh, IL. Yeah. Yeah, he, what, he sprained an ankle, yeah. right? Uh, like, it was, was going into first base the other day. So they went from the guy whose name I still don't know, Lava, Lava, Lavaca, Lava, Lava, not going to Col- work here Colossary. Colossary, sure. To Godoy, who we barely knew ye. And now they've gone from Godoy to Anthony Benboom, which I, I guess the only question is why wasn't it Benboom to begin with? Because I, I maybe it's a taxi squad thing, and it's just whoever was on the taxi squad is the guy that they put on the roster to begin with. 
But um, Anthony Ben Boom probably catches tomorrow, if I had to guess. Day game after a night game, they're not going to have Rutschman yeah. catch back-to-back days. But we've seen him do that already. So And this, and the, the weird part is, like, there's, they're only playing two games this week. Right. So, so like, w- if there were was a time like, to do why it. Couldn't, why couldn't he catch tomorrow? I mean, I look, wh- whatever. I don't want to be the guy doing the – I, man, I wrote this thing about Tyler Wells or Press Box, and the entire comment section on Facebook is just a bunch of, oh, there's young, this is ridiculous, everybody pr- trying to protect pitchers. I'm like, yo, it ain't my idea. And if Tyler Wells can throw 200 innings, by all means, go throw 200 innings. But like the m- more of the baseball people I talk, even John Smoltz, who's a notorious tough guy. Right. John Smoltz was on the shallow end. Like yesterday when we had Smoltz on, he was like, I think he can go 30 more innings. Right. And I've said the numbers have typically been between 30 and 60. I've seen, like, on the high end, maybe somebody can go 60 more innings. When he goes 200, people are going to dance on your grave, Glenn. Well, I'm, I have no idea. I'm not <laughs> trying to pretend like it just seems like that's the case. And you also but, bring in Kyle Gibson, who is supposed to just well, Kyle Gibson eating that's all you do, guy, so that's right. exactly. Right. That's, he's your innings guy. Which is supposed to set you up to maybe um, be able to and, 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 and Wells is, I, I would assume, only going to go a l- Again, Smoltz said 30 innings pass, which would be like One, early August yeah. at this point that we'd be talking about when you'd have to shut down Tyler Wells. I think that they would push for something more like 50. Again, with the age being a factor, with him being 28, it's not protecting a 23-year-old. It's, But still, you've got a couple more years of team control, and the next couple of years seem more important for the Orioles than this year does. So I could absolutely see that number still being you know, 150-something, something like that. But everybody, oh, the entire comment section is just nothing but, you know, tough guy, tough guy, tough guy, right? While so talking about that fifth starter thing, yeah, shouldn't the or- should the Orioles go and uh, rescue Jordan Lyles? Because he's not one; they haven't won a game. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, the the, Ra- the, the Royals might be plenty happy about it. Like they're not yeah. they're not trying to win right, this exactly, year, exactly. So they might be again. Is <laughs> he's the, our the best idea, asset, right? Yeah, if he's just gonna come help and. I, that, frankly, that was what the point was when they the Orioles signed Jordan Lyles a year ago. Like wins and losses don't matter. Just go lose, foot it, pitch for seven. Innings. It just so happened yeah. to be ironic that the Orioles ended up winning, and suddenly we treated it like it mattered. And Jordan Lyles was semi helpful in them winning. Uh, but the point of signing Jordan Lyles had nothing to do with wins and losses. The point of Jordan Lyles is somebody's got to pitch, and and it's got to be somebody that can give us some innings. And so the Royals are plenty happy to tell a guy to have his arm fall off. It's what I was talking about. I, I'm a little. I want to be more respectful to Gibson because he's better. Mm-hmm. He's better. But when I was talking about the scenario of having Gibson pitch last, what, what, what day that would that have been? That would have been last like Friday. Him skip a, or he yeah, he would he would have pitched yeah. on Friday and then turn around and pitch again One on Wednesday. Yeah. My point was, he's he's a mercenary. He's here right. to give you as much as he can possibly give you. He doesn't fit into the plans for 2025, we don't think. I mean, maybe they'll change their mind, and Kyle Gibson will be part of the plans for 2025. But as of right now, he ain't part of the plans for 2025. So, for God's sakes, like, what are we doing here? He's not part of the plans for 2024 at the moment, although I could certainly see a scenario where, given how he's pitched, the Orioles say, hey, it would behoove us to try to bring him back. But I don't think they're giving him a multi-year contract if they try to bring him back. So, throw his arm off. Like, do do the Stanford bit. <laughs> he threw eighty nine pitches yesterday. That guy. And did in, they win? Uh, Stanford. Yes, they did. Okay, so mm-hmm. you know that's what it is. <laughs> they didn't need him to throw one hundred and sixty pitches. Um, I I'm not. The, the it had nothing to do with it. Adley Rutschman was how we got to this topic mm-hmm. because the question is on the tough guy routine. It's easy for us to say, look, you got two days off this week. Catch both games. Come on, what are we doing here? Catch catch both games. And presumably, because isn't Saturday an afternoon game, too, this week? They're doing, yeah, the four, yes, it's yeah. a they're doing another 4 o'clock bit. Man, I'd really like to take the kids, but I think we got a birthday party on Saturday, so it won't be an option. Ooh, it's a real yeah. bummer. I want some of those 7 p.m. Saturday night games. No, we like the exact opposite in this house because oh. it means I can take the kids to the baseball games, which is not an option for a 7 o'clock game. So big fan of these 4 o'clock Saturday games, although I don't know why they choose – the, the weird part is, why did they start them when it got hotter outside? Why not do the 4 o'clock Saturday thing in April 
and then move Saturdays to night games later on in the season when it gets warmer out. That's the part right, I don't. Because then you've almost got like the situation where like not a lot of people like to go on Sundays because you're just roasting in yes, the sun all correct. day. It's like the same. It's like the same thing. I mean, it's not quite. And this has been a, a right. milder. You know, but the first three innings are going to be pretty brutal, man. Um, it, the if sun, like the sun out. is a legitimate factor. In well, now the games are quicker too. It never cools down. The That's true. It never gets to the, the point sun. where the yeah. yeah somebody, uh, one of the Tigers beat writers pointed out that the Tigers played a quote unquote night game last night and it ended twelve minutes before sundown. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> like, and I guess that means they're doing a six thirty start yeah, in Detroit. Sure. So if they played a two hour game and ended at eight thirty and the, it was still light out, that's like sundown's like eight. Yeah, that's that's all of that is quite viable. Like that all could make sense. Yes, they're doing a four o'clock game, so he's not going to catch. You know, I I don't I don't know what the plan will be for this weekend. Ben Boom will presumably catch either Saturday or Sunday. The question will be whether he catches tomorrow, and they give a rush from the day off, or whether they say, "Hey, dude, it's two games in a week. You could and you it's could raise." Yes, okay, you could play. yes, it's important. They also might do like the late inning thing that they've done a couple times this year, where they'll just stick him in there, yeah. like just to be like, like, all right, let, the bullpen's in the game now. Just catch the but bullpen. But that requires athlete. you giving the giving him the date. Like th- this is the problem with doing the late inning bit with Rutschman is y- you. It requires you to not have him in the lineup because you can't give up your DH. Right, which and we did the other day. Right, which was you know yeah you. You just don't like doing that. You don't want to do that. So I don't know that it can be your strategy going into a game. No. Um, you know, if you want to do the bit where somebody starts at DH and then Rutschman can catch the first couple innings and then move to DH at some point during the course of the game to bring in another catch, I, I don't even know how to – whatever. The point being, we might see Anthony Ben Boone this week. That's not the only roster move, though. I know I, I know I made it seem like it was a big deal and then I just gave you Anthony Ben Boone. No, that's not the only roster move the Orioles made because they also – DFA'd Spencer Watkins and Logan Gillespie is back, baby. Hell yeah. These are the big moves. But when they when the we saw we wanted the these. minor leagues moving up and down the yesterday. One that I want. Um, the Spencer Watkins story is a little sick because there were moments where mm. it felt like Spencer Watkins was a thing. There were moments he got off to a – what season was it where he got off to a really good start? Was it 21? Was it 2020 or 21? Yeah, I guess it was 21. I will always be a huge advocate for him. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that – He's one of my favorite – He's one of my favorite players on the – Well, it's not an, it's not an Oriole anymore, yeah. but well, he was I mean, one of my favorite guys. I Presumably, he could still accept an assignment back to Norfolk. But I guess. Why DFA him? To, like, why bring him up and then DFA him if you wanted – like, you could have optioned him. That's the goofy part is Spencer Watkins still had an – well, I assume he had already been optioned once this year because hadn't he already been up once this year? So you he didn't – He hasn't pitched yet this year. In the majors. In the majors, But yeah. I, right. I thought he had come up once before. So I'll you didn't – I'll look at the transaction You didn't history. have to DFA Spencer Watkins. You're just giving up on him. You're just saying – yeah, I mean, he hasn't been great, I don't think. I mean, I think he had maybe, like, a couple starts in Norfolk. Oh, I think his Norfolk EA, ERA was, like, over seven. I think oh, it was. I knew it was over five. I, I thought, thought I saw been, people, like, like joking. When when he got called up, I thought I saw him getting dunked on on Twitter because, uh, yeah, he's pitched to a 7.27 ERA in eight games this season. I think it was last year where he got sent down in May, and then he came back for the last week of June, and then he had like four straight starts where he allowed one runner. I, I'm t- there was a start to whatever. There was a start to a season. Maybe it was last year. There was a start to a season where he put together like three or four good starts, and we were starting to buy into Spencer Watkins as a thing a little bit. Uh, real quick, you were right. Yeah, he, we were called him yeah. on April fourteenth. On, yeah, on April 14th. Yeah, so, so he's been up once. So this was this. there was no need to DFA him. This is just utterly a team. This literally is nothing more than them saying, dude, it's not going to happen. There's no coming back at this point. There's no letting him clear waivers and sign him. They're saying we're done with this. We've got we've gone. And isn't he 30 at this point? Yeah, he's 30 years old. Yeah, I mean, like, and I look, I like Spencer Watkins. He's a good guy. I've enjoyed conversations with him, but this is the Oriole saying it's over. You know, we've gone as we've gone as far as this rope is going to take us. Um, it's not happening. You you can't help us. And you know, if you're pitching to a seven plus ERA when you're thirty, one and a half whip is just yeah. I can understand why a team would just say, 
th- this is a wasted roster spot for us or a wasted spot within our organization. And I, I hate sounding that cruel because uh, to a nice guy, but we, we got to be fair. About it was an it. experiment, though. That, I mean, it was a long experiment. Like he, oh, he had plenty of. Uh, it's not yeah. like this. The is, experiment lasted. Yeah, they gave seasons. him all sorts of time to try to figure and out and if it could be a thing. He allowed three runs in his first four starts of 2021. Yeah, and, and we that, were, was the, that was in July. We and were then, buying in, the, the and then in August he got absolutely shelled. Things have t- had yeah. turned for Spencer Watkins. Like we were, at, I, I remember having him on, and feeling. Remember how like happy I was for Mike Bauman? We talked to Mike yeah. Bauman this season. How was like I felt something genuine in that because you get to know these guys over the years and you to see him find success and you know how happy they are to chat with you about finding success. Like I could hear that in Mike Bauman's voice. Like he was so happy to come back on the show and talk about how like it worked after all the conversations that we had had over the years. Um, and when we had that chat in 2021 with Spencer Watkins, I felt it. Like, he was so happy to be back on with me and chatting about how it was working, how you'd been through the, the, all of the hell and you'd come out on the other side. And, you know, I enjoyed that. I appreciate those conversations. I, they do mean something to me. They make my heart happy in a little bit of a way. When, when these guys like doing the show and they like coming on and they remember the conversations that we've had, and now they get to talk about success. Like, that's always something that's really cool for me. Unfortunately, with Spencer Watkins, it was quite fleeting. Yeah. It was quite fleeting, and it didn't work out. So, Logan Gillespie is arm of the week at this moment. I guess the other interesting question is, like, why, if you're not going to use a fifth starter... Why not send Irvin, Irvin down, down, bring up another... It, and it makes me wonder if the plan isn't just to have Irvin start on Sunday, right? Like, or w- when when would he start? He start on Friday, so he would be. When would his he turn? Would his, be, t- his turn would be next Friday, right? Yes, like, yeah. so his turn again would be Friday. So maybe they're not thinking about skipping days. Maybe they're just planning on keeping everything in turn, and Irvin starts again on Friday. Gets a third chance. I mean, I the, I guess the reason why I wouldn't do that would be because it buys you the opportunity to look at Grayson one more time. If you waited until next Tuesday, next Tuesday is when you would need a fifth starter. If you waited until next Tuesday, told Cole Irvin, "Hey, you're in the bullpen for the next few days. You're a long man if needed." And then w- ride it out. Then you would get another look at Grayson, and by that point, he would have made four Triple A starts. And if he comes out and pitches really well, I would be more inclined to say, with all due respect to Cole Irvin, there's nothing that you've done that has said we need to give you more starts. Where Meanwhile, Grayson Rodriguez is Grayson Rodriguez. And if he's made four AAA starts, frankly, that's four more than you would have liked him to have been making at this point. But I think right. at some point you can't just keep sending him back out there at AAA for, and, and using up innings. And then, what, are you going to start having him deload in Sarasota too? And, and like... I think he needs to get back to the big. So I think that there's an op again, much like we talked about with the Tyler Wells thing last week. I think there's an opportunity to not pitch Cole Irvin this week and to see if you feel good about Grayson Rodriguez and slide him back into the rotation next Tuesday, which is when you would need a fifth starter. By the way, I also had the math wrong on Gunnar Henderson. They ma- they sent out a thing the Orioles did about for Gu- Gunner's 22nd birthday, they're going to do like some $22 no, it's, yeah, tickets. It's June 29th. But yes, it's next week. Yes, because it's the same birthday as mine. How about that? Yes. Look at you. You guys sharing a birthday. Are you getting together? Or are you guys uh, going that out? That was the plan. I got to I gotta text him again. Yeah, make sure you figure <laughs> that out whether or not you guys are going out and having a kiki to celebrate your birthdays next week. All right. Yes, those are the roster moves, the big ones, the ones you waited for. Logan Gillespie for Spencer Watkins, Anthony Benboom for Jose Godoy. That's. That's the ball offensive boost this team needed. That's what we were looking for. That's they they made the moves they demanded. Everyone else, they've, they've seemed to be pushing good buttons so far. I mean, mm. there's something to be said for that. <laughs> Go to pressboxonline.com slash offers right now and get $150 in bonus bets from DraftKings after you place your first $5 bet. See this and other great sportsbook offers at pressboxonline.com slash offers. Uh, tease your life t- life hack, Carson. Tease it. Uh, it keeps your hands clean keeps when eating something hand- that can be very messy. Well, I had crabs on Sunday night. Uh, your hands can. Uh, I would. All right. I mean, crabs is a whole other. All mess right. Hands, so it's good. No, that, oh, that's all. I'll leave it then. All right. Keeps your hands clean when eating a messy food. Our segment is called Carson's a hack, and we're gonna do it next. Glenn Clark Radio. 
The All-America Senior Game, powered by New Balance, will be back at Johns Hopkins Homewood Field on July 29th. The most decorated girls and boys lacrosse players in the country have been invited to play in what is the premier lacrosse event of the year. Every college coach wants their players in this game, and if you dream of being in this game, you start by trying out for one of your regional underclass teams this summer. The best against the best. Get your tickets now at allamericalacrosse.com. Are you a diehard O's fan looking for the perfect way to show your team spirit? Look no further than Birdland Sports. Birdland Sports is a small business run by fans for fans. They offer a wide variety of unofficial O's merchandise from the Birds Are Coming tees to player cartoon shirts and more. And the best part? Their prices are more affordable than the big guys. So head to BirdlandSports.com and grab your gear today. Show your support for the Birds with Birdland Sports. The latest edition of Press Box is available now. On the cover, Dave Ginsburg remembers Goose as he looks back on the impact that late Tony Saragusa had both on and off the field here in Baltimore. Plus, he explains how Goose's kids are working to continue that legacy with the Goose Flights program. Also inside, Todd Karpovich profiles the path Tyler Wells has taken to becoming a star in the Orioles rotation. And you'll find a special summer travel guide with information about events and activities throughout the state. Pressbox is available for free at over 500 area locations, including 60 Royal Farm stores. And you can always find the entire edition as well as the best daily coverage of the O's, Ravens, and Terps at PressBoxOnline.com. That first sip. That first bite. Mm. Start your day off right with a delicious breakfast at Royal Farms. Choose from a fantastic selection of fresh Royal Farms breakfast sandwiches and top it off with a rich hot cup of the freshest coffee in the world. At Royal Farms, breakfast is available day and night. It's the freshest breakfast in the world. Real fresh, real fast. Royal Farms. If you miss anything on the show, don't forget that you can watch full episodes at youtube.com slash pressbox online. And you can download podcasts on Apple, iTunes, Amazon, and Grindr. Wait, did I say Grindr? I don't think that you would find it on Grindr. Not that I know it's on Grindr or anything. I swear. On second thought, you know what? I don't care what you think. Here's Glenn. All right, back in here on GCR as we continue along on a Tuesday edition of the program. We did not make an open, did we? Uh, no, I did yeah, not we yet. Need I to, we need to do that. So it's called Carson's... Carson's a Hack Carson's is the name of hack. the segment, right? Like, okay. That's what he is. He's a hack. He's, a, he's nothing... I don't know. You guys will have no memory of this. This is the band Dynamite Hack. Mm. They did a um, cover of Boys in the Hood years ago that everybody enjoyed a great deal because it was like these basic white guys doing one of the great, you know, gangster rap songs of all time. Unfortunately, we can't play music on the show because we get booted off of. It's like, I think we could play like five seconds or something okay. like that. I, let's work on an open. Let's all get right. an open. Carson's a hack is the segment for next week. All right. Okay. Got it? Got it. You're the producer. All right. All right. Thank you. Carson's okay. a hack. What are we doing this week? All right, so first thing we got here is a cup and some milk. Mm. So what goes great with milk is is Oreos. That looks right? like chocolate milk. That yeah, they, they like didn't have any small ones of, of regular milk, so we're rolling with chocolate today. But uh, I don't know what I'm like. What is happening here? So do you ever try to dip an Oreo in milk and your hand gets like sticky? You can't get down in the milk once it gets low, right? Yeah. And then your hands get milk on them and Oreo cream and it's all nasty. I, mean, I, I don't dip my whole hand in the, in the milk. Right, say, dip the all right, yeah. But say you got Oreos in milk, right, Glenn? Uh-huh. Say you've got that much milk left. Is the camera getting this? Yes. Yeah, let's yes, make sure you've got that much milk left. you got that much milk left, yes. If I go in for a dip here with uh-huh. an Oreo... Uh-huh. You're not right. I'm really not. I, no, I get this I can't problem. Really get yeah, in this there. is an issue. I understand. And that. my hands are messy now. Uh huh. So this is what I proposed. Wait, you did you invent this life hack? No. Oh. <laughs> well, then why do you say you propose it? You said it's the internet. New, I don't know. It's a new idea. But is the internet proposing it? Does this somebody else come hack. up with it? Some guy proposed it before me, but I'm propo- I'm he's, proposing. He's, I'm he's proposing hack, it now. Right? A, I'm just. It's a not hack. only a hack. I'm just a thief. I'm just a hack, man. He's a thief. Take a fork. Uh huh. You go right through, like that. Oh. Now I can get oh all gosh, the way man. down to the bottom. I can hold it for as oh, long as I that. want. So, you know, you know, some people like to kind of soak them. Yeah, I'll just sit it there then. <laughs> well, this I'm one, watching the game on TV or whatever. Now, now, wait, you got to pull it out. Let's make sure that take it, it works. It out. 
Uh oh. Did it did it come apart? It did come apart. Yeah, it looked like there was I left some... it in for a little too long. Oh uh, <laughs> he was trying to move right past it. He was trying to pretend like the Oreo didn't break. Carson. If we try again, I can it'll All right, try it again okay. so it actually works. Like <laughs> this is the part that's troublesome about it. <laughs> is that right All now right. you're overdue. No, well I it mean It does look like it's kind of splitting the Oreo. If you have double stuff, I'm sure it's I know, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe Dip it works it. better for double Pull stuff. It out. There you go. Okay. 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 It it can work. Well, it, I it think can it did. Work. It did work. It, well, the first time it didn't work. Well, because yeah, he left it. In <laughs> I yeah. flew cl- too close to the sun. Yeah. I'm yeah. Oh, Icarus over <laughs> here. He's flying too close to the sun. So the point is, you get a fork, you stick it through the cream of the Oreo. Yes. Do you rest it against the edge of the either cookie? Like, um, do you feel? Do you feel fork touch cookie? I just. Or does it go cleanly through the cream? I feel like in a double. I just went. Let me, let I just me went test it. Let me yeah. try it. Let me see if I can. I don't want to. Glenn wants to make sure he pokes all the holes. Yeah, at yeah this is state. important because I'm going to tell my kids. About I just went right this. through the cream. <laughs> I am not. I'm not an Oreo. Uh, I try all the new flavors of Oreos, but I don't. I just have one. I saw like a caramel this one in there too. Next it kind of intriguing. Uh, they brought back cotton candy Oreos recently, and everybody was messaging me about it. I've tried the cotton, cotton candy Oreo. Candy Oreo. So inevitably, there you go. Yeah, that's oh. the problem. Well, you right? went through like. But that's what I'm saying. Like, I got to make the sure that I didn't try all that hard. I wasn't purposely attempting to break the Oreo. All right, hang on a second. You got to you gotta be a little gentle with it. So you're it, saying Glenn. you take the Oreo out of the, the box. And just be very gentle. Be very There you go. Gentle. You got you got a grip on it now. Okay. And then it just slides smoothly through. Does he ha- how you don't got to go all the way. <laughs> not very far. You in. don't have to always. I mean, that's hard. Like, fact, you can if you right want, to but you sometimes you, you have to make some love and give her some smooches, too. You don't have to. You can do it. It's it's a, it's personal uh, preference there. All right. That worked. You want that Oreo? Because I don't want it. It's fine. Yeah, no, no. Go ahead. Oh, Enjoy yeah. it. It's, it's my, my gift to you. I'm baby birding it to you. I'm not going to get it on this uh, print issue. That's, I appreciate that. That's why I put it over the Oreo package. All right. I will. Well done. I will say this one actually works. This is a very specific life hack. If you're someone who enjoys milk dunking Oreos. your or Oreos in milk, this provides you the opportunity to, when you have lesser milk, it's do a very like again, it's very specific. Do we think it would work with like chocolate I chip cookies or something? I mean, then you're well. Where would you be putting the fork through? The chocolate chip cookie. No. You need, I guess, you need soft. You really need really soft. And then at that point, you, you need a cream filled cookie. Th- we begin the the chocolate chip cookie problem is bigger because like if if it's soft the way you want it to be soft, then you don't need much milk. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, Vienna fingers too. Uh, El fudge cookies. Yeah, anything with cream in the middle. There's some. Uh, there's some yeah. other. Cookie anything with cream in the middle would work if you're trying to dip that particular cookie. All right, it's it's a v- extr- It's not going to improve anybody's life, but you know, it just, is an option. He just hacked life. It's an option. <laughs> If this isn't this isn't a game changer necessarily as much as it's just a different way of going about doing it a cleaner way like, like I, I don't I, gotta wash my I hands. think like w- like w- again the how many Oreos you would have to eat for you to get to the bottom well, of you're the also cup. drinking the milk at the same time. I mean if you like I'm not saying this has never happened to me before because I was a fat guy among fat guys at one point time in my life but you've got to be talking about 8 to 10 Oreos at this point in order to get your milk down to the point where you can't dunk it. That's so true. Well, it's a very specific well, that's I also assu- milk. that's I all I was going to say that's also yeah. assuming that you're like me I don't really eat Oreos and milk very often but when I do I dunk the thing and I eat it and then I definitely take a sip of milk after. So like I might I might be four I might be four down. Oreos. Maybe, maybe the argument is this a lot cuz I think most people just say the milk at that point is only for dunking. It's not for sipping. And what sure. you're creating is a snar- scenario is by which your milk can also be for sipping while dunking. For sure. me personally there's no self control. Yeah. I'm going to be drinking the milk even if I t- say to myself this is a strictly dunking. You know it's really weird. I've never when I was that when I was this man I never found myself saying like I need to drink more of this milk. I was more I need to conserve well, the milk in front of for me, the purpose of the dipping. I like milk. Okay, fair yeah. enough. So that's fair a new enough. one. I've never heard of people conserving the milk. That's, oh, that's I interesting. One thousand percent was thinking about this problem in interesting. my life. Interesting. So again, you, I guess you have helped me say to myself, I don't need to worry about that. I can worry. I can enjoy sure. the milk as well because I can dunk with the fork. I got right, uh, next week's a good one too. So okay, definitely. This is not nothing. That's what I'll get. I'm not. I, last week was a zero. This is something. This is like a four. Like it's it's good, but it's not. It's not four. Isn't a good score. Do we it, just put a uh, old bay on the Oreos? I was actually going to ask that. I mean, like, they're here. <laughs> we might as well try it, right? Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I mean, I'll go grab uh, some some paper yeah, towels. We do. Yeah. yeah. Go get some. Go get some of those. Son of a bitch. He's right. When he's right, he's right. And it is kind of our shtick. The question is, are we going to put it on top? I think we should open them up and you put the old bay in between the on the in cream. 
Old Bay cream stuffed Oreos. Right. Both both of you are right. I, in fact, there's an argument we need to try it both ways. There's an yeah. argument that we have to do both things. God. And I, th- this is the bigger problem because I don't want to eat many Oreos. We we kind of have to do the same thing we did last week where there's a light and a heavy, right? Like, we kind of have to do both things and see how it goes. It's for science. All right, so here's what I need you to do. I need you to prepare, like take the tops off. No take, take your top off, Carson. Split it so we can get the uh, old All bay. Right. And, and Griffin, hold hand. Did you hand the old bay over? Yeah. Please pass the old bay over so we Thanks, can. Thanks, Griffin. All right. So y- you want one heavy, one light, just like last time? I think that's what we need to do, right? Yeah. We need to we need to do the yeah. we're we're taking yeah yeah watch that that's sexy ah <laughs> well done good twist good twist can you do it again can you do it without breaking the Oreo Ooh. oh that's two for two. Two for two. That's brilliant. Hold that's on. brilliant. I might right. go in a rise. Oh, you uh, want to go six one up a rise and go six for six. You want to go six or six? Yeah, you think Luis Arias can do that? No. Oh, oh. man, he's three for hold three. On, hold on. Hey, oh my you know what god. They say? You can't get the six until you get the fourth one. Oh. And the fifth one right oh, here. This is brilliant. I'm watching an oh, artist at my. work right now. Holy crap. There's so much pressure on this one. Yeah, I'm f- I went five for five. It's in next year innings now. Yeah, Big right. six. Cal Ripken went six for six in Atlanta. Oh my that must Holy that was the cleanest one out of all of them. Good job, Carson. Well done. Carson is Cal Ripken. Look at that. Look at right. how that happened. So we're, we're going to go light. Light here. on one. Yeah, light. Just a, a uh, little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, a little. Cover it, right? Yeah, a little bit. And then. Right, and and then. then. Oh, God. That's a lot. All there's, right. That's not. There's no way that's going to be any good. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. On the other. Oh, boy. This is uh, this is what we've offered to you, Baltimore. <laughs> this is this is what we prepared I think for this is Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, but this is important. All right. It's all right. Hold all right. on. I, I This one's like super, super light. We need to put a little more on this side. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Very good. All right. And then I'll close them back up, I guess. So we're going, uh, which one do we do first? We do light first. Because the light yeah. one, there's light a chance. Light is like, there's a chance I actually like yeah, it. Yeah, you know? there's a chance there's something. Heavy there. is just supposed to be funny, I guess. All right. <laughs> Here's to swimming with bow-legged which, women. Which one is which here? Uh, uh, this is your light one right here. Yeah. All right. The heavy one's one with the big yeah. trail of old bay. All and right. Uh, right. bon appetit. It doesn't break through. It doesn't yeah. break through at all. It doesn't. There's no. That's, ins- that's crazy that there's. You, you don't taste, taste the any Obey at all. Wow. It's just an Oreo. I think it's because the chocolate is so heavy. Yeah. It's just weird, though. Like, you don't. I would never have known it was in there. If yeah. You wouldn't there's have told no. Me. Uh, you don't taste. I, you could hand that to somebody and say, and they would just say it's an Oreo. That's all it is. So this might be the rare occasion where the heavy Old Bay is the way to go. Imagine if this doesn't break through. Then we got to start talking about what it is they're doing at the the National <laughs> Biscuit Oreo. Company with their Oreos. If somehow heavy old day. Just real quick. I've had some Oreo moments on this show. Thinking what was back. the other? What was the other Oreo? The Golic, the mayonnaise. Oh. <laughs> had some God. Oreo moments. I forgot about those. Oh. Oh. Cuz he was on the show, right? Or no, his right. dad was his on. His dad show. was on the show. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> All let's right. go with the heavy Oreo. See if there's a thing there. Here we go. Heavy Oreo. You at least it breaks through. I still don't really taste it, like. But it's not a factor. No. So we gotta go again and go even heavier. Yeah. That's what we have to do. No, I think we got our answer. Unlike the pineapple, which was a thing. This is not a thing. This is nothing. Well, I'm not sure if we know yet. Stop, Griffin. If you can put that much Old Bay and there's no impact on it, then it's there is no point to this. We got dr- that we point. Gotta, I'm just pumping sodium into my veins right. every every time. Um, yeah, I guess so. this is the definitive. But, I mean, you're already eating Oreos. So. Uh, we could give it a, a grade if you want. Give it on a on a scale of one to ten. Well, it's just an Oreo, really. I was to say Oreo for me is about an eight out of that's, ten. That's so I don't problem, think I'm giving right? it an eight. I, mean, I, I hear Oreo. you. That's why uh, I think we have to go again. But I think you have to reconsider your grade. Consider your grade in the context of what it should what it should or should not offer. The pop tarts is going to hurt this one because you guys really like the, the pop tarts, really which was good. a sweet thing. So like this should be good, and yeah, it's yeah, this the same. Nothing. This is a big old bowl of nothing here. So chocolate and Old Bay. Well, well, but I've had yeah, like exactly. Old Bay chocolate, and it can be pretty good. This I don't know what it is. The, the Old Bay Oreo does not work. It is not. A, again, on my lips, I taste a little bit of the spice of the Old Bay, so like I know it's there, but. It has done nothing to the flavor profile whatsoever. Nothing at all. And now, again, it hasn't really detracted from it either. It didn't make the Oreo drastically worse. It's just, it's a giant. It's an Oreo, though. 
a giant bowl of mine. Tastes like, you know what it tastes like? You just ate crabs, and then you have, like, three Oreos for dessert. And, like, and the crab- so you have the leftovers yeah. that's sort of lingering. Yeah, I hear you. I just. That's, like, what I'd compare it to. I mean, I don't even think it. Reg- I think that would register more than this would. True. Like, I, this just did not register in any way. All right, but we did it. We've accomplished that now, and so we'll be able to tell our grandkids one day that we did yeah, Oreo, Old Bay Oreo. That's the new flavor. That's what we have going for us. Mm-hmm. You know what else we have going for us? This new print issue of Press Box, which is available right now at your neighborhood Royal Farms and at the hundreds of locations around town where you find Press Box. You can read it all at PressBoxOnline.com. Very special issue, um, as you see on the cover. Tony Saragusa, the late, great Tony Saragusa, Dave Ginsburg. Uh, dove into the legacy of Tony Saragusa and how his kids are working to keep his incredible legacy alive now. It's a really powerful story. Would encourage you to pick it up. Also inside, you find a very special summer travel guide highlighting sports events and activities around the state of Maryland. Again, right now, pick it up for free at your neighborhood Royal Farms. Read it all, pressboxonline.com. Um, I had to close my laptop with all the old bay there. Uh, you got a movie review in you today? Uh, yeah, sure. I can do a movie review w- w- today. Would it be Forgetting Sarah Marshall? It would be Forgetting oh, Sarah Marshall. Oh, this is an important one to me. It's been a long time. Do we still have the uh, open for oh, this? Yeah, 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 yeah I, should we do. I should have the open I hope we do. All right. All right. Griffin's. Let me find my review. We can here. take a break first. Oh, okay. We can take a break first, and then we'll come back in. Griffin reviews Forgetting Sarah Marshall. That's right. And then we'll do a tidbit and two, but to wrap it up for the okay. day. It is a Tuesday edition of GCR. Your summer destination is closer than you think at Live Casino and Hotel Maryland. With an expansive gaming floor and incredible dining options ready for you to explore, your adventure awaits. Dine at the new Coho Korean Barbecue House coming in July or on the patio at the Prime Rib. Enjoy the summertime breeze at Orchid Smoking Patio. Limited time packages starting at $229. What are you waiting for? Book now. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Please play responsibly for help. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call one gambler. The Orioles are off and running out to prove that last season wasn't a fluke and they are one of the best teams in baseball. Hi, I'm Paul Valley, host of the Bat Around for Press Box. Tune in every Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon as Zach Goodman and I break down every Adley bomb, every Tony Tater, and every save from the mountain. Like a warm hug from Rutschman, the Bat Around has you covered with all things Orioles as we embark on what's sure to be a magical summer in Birdland. So tune in every Saturday for the best in Orioles coverage right here on the Bat Around. Whether your focus is luxury and comfort, convenience and technologically advanced connectivity, or sporty performance and aggressive styling, we've got the perfect Highlander for you. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Highlanders from your local Toyota dealer today. Costas Inn has been serving up delicious steamed crabs for over 50 years. Lately, the crabs you want to eat when the weather warms up have gotten harder and harder to get. So get your crab eating game plan in place. Make sure to stick this number on your fridge, 410 477 1975. Call ahead and reserve the size crabs you want. You may be able to walk in, but you may also be disappointed at the size or maybe even get shut out altogether. So call ahead, have a plan, and then arrive on your crab eating vacation. Costas also has delicious crab soup and crab cakes. The Costas Inn at 4100 North Point Boulevard. For more than 50 years, they've been satisfying crab lovers in and around Baltimore. That first sip. That first bite. Mm. Start your day off right with a delicious breakfast at Royal Farms. Choose from a fantastic selection of fresh Royal Farms breakfast sandwiches and top it off with a rich hot cup of the freshest coffee in the world. At Royal Farms, breakfast is available day and night. It's the freshest breakfast in the world. Real fresh, real fast, Royal Farms. If you need more of Glenn, you can also hear him every Sunday with Rita on 105.7 The Fan. But also, if you need more of Glenn, um, what's wrong with you? So what's happening in the comments? What's going on over there? Everybody, uh, yeah, we, yeah. Your microphone would be the first couple, thing. A couple, uh, couple uh, ideas for a proposal uh, to mm-hmm. trade uh, with the Cubs. Uh, okay. who, some, some guys want the uh, – Randall wants to make a trade for Cody Bellinger and Marcus Stroman. Both? Both. Okay. Wants the Orioles to go get both. And who is, what was the other – uh, oh, Woodsman. Woodsman will also. He is. Hold on. I, he he says Irvin. He's pointing out that Irvin has three years of team control. So right. I guess that's why they want to keep giving him a chance. But uh, he he doesn't uh-huh. want to trade three to five prospects for Stroman and Bellinger. Okay, so I don't understand I how team control would have anything to do with like 
Like, I'm not suggesting the Orioles give up on. I'm not saying they should <laughs> Spencer Watkins, Cole Irvin. Um, as much as I'm saying that right now, I think that the, I think your priority should be Grayson Rodriguez. Now, if if the point is let's let's have Cole Irvin make another start and then let's judge after that. Like, okay, I'll I'll listen to it, and maybe at some point with Grayson Rodriguez and Tyler Wells both having innings issues. You're you're kind of rotating them as a fifth starter at some point. Like I I don't know exactly what that looks like, but Grayson Rodriguez to me is the priority. And if he pitches for a month, four starts worth of of pitching well at Triple A, I just don't know what the point is of continuing to have him pitch at Triple A. That you've got a limited number of innings for Grayson Rodriguez this season. Why use them at Triple A? And at that point, I would rather if the problem with Grayson Rodriguez is the third time through the lineup, I'd rather him be pitching out of the bullpen in Baltimore. I just don't think having someone use innings at AAA when you're trying to win baseball games and you've got a limited number of innings makes any sense. Now, again, in the world where we don't care about innings limits and we just think these guys' arms can all fall off, then that, that doesn't register the same way. But if the Orioles have decided this is the number of innings that Grayson Rodriguez can throw, then I only want so many of them to come at AAA, and I would rather them be used in some form or fashion – like let's we've been talking about the B bullpen problem that the Orioles have had for some time. Like they've got a B bullpen problem that hopefully will be helped out by by Dylan Tate getting here and moving into the A bullpen. And I don't know, maybe Michael Givens could still end up in the A bullpen at some point, although the guy that we saw when he was up the first time, we're very concerned about whether that can be an A bullpen guy. So maybe they will be helped out and there'll be more guys that can move into the A bullpen and so you know, you don't have a B bullpen problem, but their B bullpen is like we saw it on Friday in the Cole Irvin game. There's not a lot to like there, and I, even Michael Bauman, who's in their A bullpen, struggled on Friday. But then everybody else was a, was a mess. So I'll say the same thing about DL Hall. I'd rather these guys be giving their innings at the major league level than, and if that means they're pitching out of the bullpen, so be it. I just think they all need to be at the major league level, and I don't need to see Logan Gillespie unless. Again, Logan Gillespie comes up and looks like Guinea or Cano, in which case, then by all means, let's keep it going with Logan Gillespie. All right. Um, oh, but back to the point about um, Stroman and Bellinger. I mean, you guys realize the issue there. The Cubs are very much in the NL Central race. NL Central stinks. Like, we can talk about, you know, the fact that the Cubs aren't very good, but it's no one's grabs. very good. Because if the you think the Reds are – have longevity this year. I mean I I love the story but like I don't think anyone actually thinks that in I, a I month the Reds are still going to be leading that division. I think it's very hard to figure out what the Reds are. So let's let's cover both ends of it. The, the first thing I would say is the Cubs by the way are closer to first place in their division than the Orioles are. The Cubs are within three and a half games of first place. The Orioles are five games out. The Cubs are absolutely in their race and it's to the point that that you're making it's not even to me, as much about whether or not the Reds might be just the team that is young, has the momentum, is exciting, and is going to remain viable to September. I mean, the Orioles remained viable to September a year ago. In I was going to say, kind of similar a, to us. In a much better division than what the Reds are in. I'm not trying to suggest the Reds are going to crash and burn. I think the question is, even if the Reds are able to stay viable, can they separate themselves enough by July 31st that the Cubs would make a decision like that? I, Stroman has been intriguing to me, too. I, I don't, you know, Bellinger, sure. I'm not saying no, but I kind of... Another left-hander that can play the outfield. I like, mean, that's what we have a lot of. Yeah, I think it's kind of... I, I, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to say. Yeah, why, would you, why would you ever turn down a good baseball player, sure. right? Like, yeah, sure, but you actually have to give something up for it, and I'm not sure that makes sense. But Stroman does make sense. Yeah. And I, and I want to talk about Stroman because I think that's a very logical target for the Orioles. What's, what's Stroman's? He can opt out after this year. That makes it very difficult because he almost certainly will. So because I think he's of got like a 20 – it's a twenty something million dollar player option he's got. But, so. but pitching contracts aren't coming back to right, the not, reality. He's like, not exercising he's, that. I well no, I'm saying right. You're saying he's not gonna take his option. Oh yeah, he's he, yeah, it's, I think he he's has gonna it, say he's just not gonna let me go find out what else is on the market. So yes, with the option, I, I would probably say no to Stroman as well, 
on top of everything else. And I, that's a difficult one for me because I like Marcus Stroman. But unless you're talking to him ahead of time and saying, dude, how do we make this work to make sure he's going to be here beyond this year, I, I can't take on someone. I, I continue to say it. As exciting as this season is, I can't give up actual assets for rentals when I don't believe this is a year the Orioles can win the World Series. Really. Like, I get it. And the argument is once you get in, anything can happen. I don't really believe this Orioles team can win a World Series. And if you were so, going to do something at the deadline, I I just don't think it – like, that's a lot. We're going to give up a package. If, uh, if the or, I, yeah. Do I think the Orioles are going to do something at the deadline? Well, yeah. I think they'll yeah. do something, sure. But, but it might be something more along the lines of, like, but let's I've, go get, like, Scott Barlow for the bullpen from Kansas City or something. I've talked, or a Lance Lynn or I've something. I've talked a Small. lot about – um, Corbin Burns for the last year. And again, the Brewers also are not going to be out of this. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to be out of it. Pirates suddenly call up Henry Davis, right? Like, everybody in the NL Central is looking and saying, why not? Let's go give it a shot because it's wide open for the taking. Brewers will trade, though. Like you said, I know we talked the about Brewers that a couple weeks ago. They, the, they, they, the, they could be very much in it, and they would still trade. They are the flips. Well, we think they could. They, they, They've shown really, that they would. Though. Nobody knows exactly what they're going to try to do there. Sure. But yes, there is reason to think that the Brewers, because of how they do business, would, despite being in it, be willing to trade. A- and maybe the Cubs would say the same thing. Like, I don't know, but I, I just find it harder to believe. M- the, as a, the reason I've always said Burns is because the extra year makes all the difference. Like, the, the additional season of um, control makes all of the difference to me because you can start to paint a picture. Not where I'm telling you it's likely that the Orioles win the World Series in 2024, but that it's practical b- to believe that with the continued progression of Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rutschman and another pitcher added into the mix, that you could get to a point next year, now you're talking about having Kowser, if you haven't traded away Westberg, Westberg, mm-hmm. uh, early next year Heston Kerstad, and late next year Norby, Jackson Holiday, Maybe, right? Like, But those are guys that we're not sure. Like, we're t- I'm talking about the highest level. Oh, for sure. Um, you can start to sell yourself that it's possible. It's possible next year. So that's why Burns has always been more interesting to me. Stroman with the option. I I just don't see it. I, I don't see that being I, – I couldn't give that my thumbs up and say it's worth it to give up an asset right now for someone that might be gone at the end of the year. It's got to be someone with a little bit more control, and even a little bit more. Like, again, with Burns, I'm only talking about the difference in one year. But it's just more practical to me, whereas I don't see this as being a World Series team this year. Oh. What? Maybe that's probably – maybe that is – like, didn't we talk about that being the issue? Is that, like, this could be – maybe this is the window? Yeah, I mean, it's always – whenever you have this conversation, you have to go through all of the elements of it and say, well, hey, the Cubs didn't know that mm-hmm. the year they won the World Series was going to be their best chance. Right. I'm, I, I have flirted with this, and there have been times where I've thought to myself, like, hey, if – if what somebody's asking for is minimal, right, like remembering that it only cost blank to trade for Manny Machado as a rental once upon a time, it, but ships. the Orioles were definitively out of it. If the Cubs are going to make a Stroman trade while they're in the race, you would have to be giving up a real asset. Now, a terrible team, like the, the word I think the last week was that the White Sox are only interested in trading away rentals. They're not interested in trading away anybody that has team control beyond this year. So I got to remind me off the top of my head which of the pitchers is Cease or Giolito. They w- I think Giolito's done after this year. I don't know about Cease, though. All right. Here. Here's, here's this part of the program. Contra- um, he is – Lucas Giolito is indeed. This is his final year and of arbitration. And this arbitra- is Cease's one-year deal as well. Or w- He's on the one-year deal, it says. Well, but is he still arbitration el- eligible? or Loading. Uh, okay. Yes, well, is. What do you mean? What, yes, what? Is arbitration eligible. For next year. Yes, yes so Cease year. has got two more years of team control. So Cease, you would take him off the list if the White Sox are being honest about what they're willing to trade. And, again, I could see where they would say, hey, we're not trying to rip everything apart. We're we're just acknowledging it's not going to happen this year. But the Cubs said that in whatever year that was. Fair. 20, that's, whatever that's year, fair. And then they went on a West Coast trip and went like 2-8, and eight, and yep. then everyone was and, gone. And so. the, maybe the White Sox will end up doing the same thing. But if they're saying, hey, we're not going to win this year anyway, we'll just take whatever for Lucas Giolito, and the Orioles don't have to trade from their top assets. Remember that the asset in the Machado deal was Yusniel Diaz. 
which didn't work out. But that was the guy that was considered the asset from the Dodgers that they put in the Machado trade. So I'm not suggesting that you'd even be able to get, again, that was for Manny Machado. We're talking about for Lucas Giolito. But who is that caliber player that the Orioles would say, we could give that up for a rental just to help ourselves? Now, the Dodgers were trying to win a World Series that year. The Orioles, I don't think, would be. But if they wanted to do it with Giolito, what would you be willing to give up for a rental Giolito? And if the answer, if what you said to me was, hey, it, it's not going to take, you know, anything crazy. Judd Fabian could get you Lucas Giolito. Okay. Like, let, now all of a sudden my opposition to a rental is measured against what the cost is. Judd Fabian might turn out to be a hell of a baseball player, but he's definitely not part of the solution in our minds to the Orioles winning a World Series in the next couple of years. So could you add a Giolito on a rental, improve your chances for this year? Still probably not going to win the World Series, but I don't know. Maybe maybe things get interesting at mm-hmm. some point. And you didn't have to give up one of the guys that we think is part of the answer or one of the guys that can land you a, you know, Dylan Cease. Okay, I'll talk, right? Like, again, I'm not saying I want to do it. Hudson Haskin, if that's what you're giving up. And I'm not trying to tell you that I want to run those guys out, but – I'll listen. If it's not a, it's not one of our top ten guys. That's what like, I'm saying. Like yeah. if it's not if it's not Westberg or Kowser or Kerstad or like if you're getting deeper on the list. Which brings up an interesting possibility of like almost like a bundle too. If you were like Yeah. Hey I man, what it, you know, you want you want Beavers and, and Norby and then we'll we'll call it even and then, you know, would you do that? For a rental? I I'd, personally I wouldn't. But I that's think me. that Norby. There's can, probably a lot of people I think that, that say, Norby yeah, can it. be more helpful in a trade than to use him for a rental. I I would not. I think Norby is still a and I agree a viable asset. And if you're trading him, I want it to be for somebody that you have control with. I don't want to trade Norby for a rental. I like. A, God, I haven't looked at the top there. The, the Orioles top thirty prospects list. Let me just pull it up right now. Um, definitely wouldn't trade Povich either. Yeah, because uh, I mean, th- that's but that's he was light. You're kind of saying that though. for the most part out of the the lack of high level pitching. Oh no depth, doubt, right? No doubt. Like whereas if he we is had one other guy, I would probably say yeah, it's fine. Yeah, but. he's outside of your top ten. If they wanted uh, Max Wagner in a trade for a rental, sure, is their twelfth prospect right now. And again, that doesn't mean that any of these guys aren't going to turn out to be a thing. Prieto, if Prieto was the guy that somebody else looked at and said. We think that's our major league shortstop right now, and the Orioles say, "Well, he's just never going to be." I, mm, for oddly, it still feels like Prieto shouldn't be traded for a rental. But I mean, if we're acknowledging There's so many that we just don't ever see a path, and that's what it takes. Prieto is still not registering, despite his absurd offensive success, because he's 24. Like everybody's saying, you should be doing that at Double A. Um, Prieto is still not registering as a viable top prospect, but if somebody else looked at him and said, "Dude, the guy had 370 at Double A, like whatever it was, maybe it was 360." I don't remember. Yeah, I it was down to 360, I guess, when he got. But I mean, they saw um, enough to promote him. So yeah, 100. percent I'm talking in circles at this point. I, I, the idea, what I'm willing to trade for a rental is a secondary asset. I'm not trading a priority asset for a rental player. And Stroman would be a rental player. So I, I don't I don't think the math works for the Cubs, who are likely to still be in the race at that point. And who spent money. Yes. To so they're going to the true. bitter end. So they're going to they can't. Just give up for secondary assets. I would think they would want to make that. The cost on Stroman would be much higher. Then, then it would be for the White Sox. I yeah. think the White Sox, given where they, they have to get rid of their rentals. And they want to. Correct. So we do Giulio and Gavin Sheets. Right. For, uh, I look. I love Gavin. <laughs> don't get me wrong. That's my guy. But uh, or Jake Berger or Andrew Vaughn. Like Gavin, you play there's first guys. Too. I hear you. There's I guys. Hear you. All right. Let's. Uh, do you have the open? Uh, yes, I think I do. I okay. Have. I think I do. I asked you for it 20 minutes ago. <laughs> do you have the open? Uh, yes. Like ready? Can you hit it? Yeah. Oh, Let's that, do that, it. that's your third of the open. Yes. It's so. time for Griffin's movie reviews. I do love some sexy Jeremy voice. That does make me happy. All right, so if you don't know the bit, um, every now and then I'll make a rep. Oh, hello. Um, I'll make a reference to a film that is a classic film, and I will look over and I will see this face from Griffin. 
It sounded uh, funny. Because uh, uh. he has no idea. And then it bothers me because I get it. He's young. But like there are just certain films that no matter how old you are, you should have seen. Now, so far, we've done reviews for Tommy Boy. Tommy Boy. We did Road Trip. We did which Road now, Trip. I admit Road Trip was not a classic. It was a cult classic. It's not one that you needed to have seen. What was was there another one? That, did you Super Bad? Right, uh, yeah. Super. No, I've 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 seen Super Bad many times. Why did I think that we did a review Super, for Super uh, Bad? I feel like I wrote down the ones that I've watched. Mm. I have to find where I wrote it though. Okay, this well, is this thing. is dynamite, yeah. dynamite <laughs> radio. Right but yeah, now. I mean, you know, Tommy Boy was great. So it was something about Mary, maybe. Uh, that one's on the list. I haven't watched uh, that one yet. Though. I, I thought we did a third one. I thought we had done. I also three. thought we did a third one, but uh, yeah, Road Trip and for, or Tommy Boy, are the only Tommy ones Boy, that you remember too. Yeah. yeah, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. <laughs> is the film. Now, I have spoken many times about how important Forgetting Sarah Marshall is to me. I believe it to be the greatest comedy of this century. Um, I I would like to quit doing this show and instead just do a podcast called Remembering Sarah Marshall where we just talk about different elements of Forgetting Sarah Marshall for forever because Forgetting Sarah Marshall to me is one of the most important films. And in an era where... In this century, there have been far fewer... Cr- and by the way, when I say this, I'm separating Superbad from... Because com- Superbad to me is a coming-of-age comedy. This is just a pure slapstick comedy, and there have been very few that have registered to me the way that Forgetting Sarah Marshall has. I feel very strongly about this film. From the year 2008, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, of course, stars... What a year. Uh, Superbad and Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Was it, uh, Superbad 08, too? I thought, yeah. o- I thought Superbad was 07 for some reason. Maybe I thought it was, it was the summer of 07. Oh. Um, Let me confirm for you in two seconds. For you. Yeah. No, it was 07. Yeah, You're right. Yeah, yeah. Don't test me on this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Aughts comedies. I've got, I'm, I'm all over it. <laughs> um, stars uh, Jason Siegel, as well as Kristen Bell, Mila Kunis, and Russell Brand, amongst others. A lot of uh, uh, cameos in there. What's his face? Bill Hader's in it. Bill Hader uh, plays the brother in law. Yes, the brother in law. Um, there's the, 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 the pa- Kenneth, the page from 30 Rock. Yeah, is brilliant. Um, absolutely wonderful. He doesn't know how film. to have sex with his wife. Correct. It's it's oh, it's so beautiful. Paul Rudd Paul has Rudd a phenomenal it. cameo in this film. <laughs> there are the number of times in my uh, you know I don't want to give anything away because I want you to talk about okay. it. But there is a particular uh, among his many one-liners in this film. There's one that I regularly use over and over again. Has stayed with me throughout my life. Some great, really great comedies throughout this movie or uh, cameos throughout this movie. Um, what did you know about forgetting Sarah Marshall going in? Griffin? I really didn't know anything. I, I don't know how I you got had, to that point. This was yeah. a total blind spot. Pretty for much. You, forgetting I, Sarah Marshall. Yeah, I didn't know Bill Hader was in it, so that was a great surprise. I, I always love. I I'll always love a, a nice surprise appearance from Bill Hader. Oh God, Jonah Hill. God, yeah, Jonah yeah, Hill I is in it. Completely forgot. What an <laughs> yes. amazing cameo from Jonah Hill. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, Jonah Hill. Um, I mean, yeah. Otherwise, I really didn't know. I I, I knew. Pretty much next to nothing. I don't wow. think. Wow. Like, yeah. All like right. The so, wh- so what were your expectations coming into the film? I guess I, I guess uh, you know to, to be entertained. And laugh, okay. And laugh, is that just because of how highly I speak yes. of forgetting Sarah Marshall? Yes. That was the only reason yeah. why you felt that way. Is yeah. There was I. You know, I worked at a restaurant in high school, and there was a, a a cook who one time talked about forgetting Sarah Marshall, and he was like, "It's one of the greatest films ever made." Yeah, I'm going a, home to watch. He's forgetting a thousand Sarah Marshall percent right tonight. about it. I need to know who this and cook was, like, was right. because I want to shake his. I want to shake your hand. It might have been Jason. I want to find Jason, <laughs> track him down, and bring him in here. It now, John, make it very though. clear. All he's here to do is shake my hand and then out the door. All right? <laughs> I don't have time for anything other than that. Bring him in. Rock him right up to me. I want to shake your hand. And then gone. All right? Understand? Okay. Get on that with Jason. That's what I want to do. It might have been John, though. So I gotta... um, your, when, when within the film was the first time that you thought to yourself, Oh, there might be something here. What was the first reaction that you had? Because it should have only have taken a couple of seconds into the film. Yeah, you know, once uh, once uh, Jason Siegel was uh, butt naked. The greatest open, the <laughs> greatest opening scene in cinema history. If you are not familiar, spoiler: it's a fifteen-year-old movie. Oh God, we should be doing more to celebrate the fifteenth anniversary of Forgetting Sarah Marshall. It's coming up. We should on be tracking and... people down to talk to them about it. Um. Came out April. Oh, we we, we, just we already missed, missed the it. It anniversary. Well, we can have a year long celebration okay. of the fifteenth anniversary. For Start inviting all the all the, all the yes. Cast. Reach, please reach out to everybody but Russell Brand. He's a psychopath. I don't think I have any interest in talking to Russell Brand. He was pretty Although, good. At, he was pretty good in this. I, he's great in this. <laughs> and if we could keep him on topic, like if he's willing to just come, I've, I think I think I think I watched an interview. Like you can't you can't control Russell Brand in an interview. He's going to get 
he's putting himself over. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. There is no keeping him He was great in bedtime stories, too. I don't... What was bedtime stories? Oh, yeah, bedtime stories. That was Russell, the Adam Sandler. He, yeah, he plays yeah. like... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm he sorry. plays like one of Adam Sandler's will be friends right. that works yeah. at the this hotel. This will be a film that your pal will never view. No, it was definitely made... I mean, he was, I was great like 10 in years it, old when it came out, but never it was definitely view. made for... Your kids uh, would actually probably really like it. Thank you, Chris. Yes, Kenneth the Page is Jack McBrayer is the name of the actor. Yes. The greatest opening sequence in cinema history is... Look, if you don't want to know, you don't want to know, but uh, we're talking about it. It's a 15-year-old film. <laughs> when <laughs> Kristen Bell is getting ready, is is not home, and so by himself, Jason Siegel is just doing bachelor things, eating cereal um, in his underpants, things like that. And Kristen Bell comes home, and he says he's very excited because he's you know he's one he's with Kristen Bell who's a famous actress and much more attractive than he is and all of these things. Sarah Marshall. Yes, Sarah Marshall is she is Sarah Marshall, and it, he says I've got a surprise for you, <laughs> and he drops trowel, and you see everything, <laughs> and it's so great. And I w- like I, I wish I could go back to the theater. For the moment, this is back in the day when, like, we would go on a Friday night. Be, we actually, we might have done a Thursday midnight thing for this. And it was a packed theater. I mean, it was packed. And the place erupted. I mean, er- so two minutes in? Erupted. Lost it. Wow. It's so good. And then the scene, it, it, it turns, because that's the, the punch you in your face comedy. And then it turns into cringe comedy immediately afterwards because he stays naked as she breaks up with him. Peter, you want to put on some pants? No. <laughs> no. If I put on pants, then it's real. <laughs> the number of times that I have done the I've got a surprise for you in my life, that number is greater than a 1,000. Not necessarily when I was naked, like not recreating I was about the to ask. <laughs> no, not necessarily that. that. I mean, I've done it. Def- I've a 1,000%. The number percent. of times I've been naked. Right. I've definitely <laughs> done the bit with like a girl that I was dating where I was like, I've got a surprise. But I'm saying, like, even when, yeah, you know, just casually in conversation, I'm like, oh, there's something I want to tell you. I've got a surprise for you. Like, I've done that a billion times. So, at that point, did you realize what you were in? For? Yeah, I think so. I think at that point, yeah. And then, uh, give me three of your favorite moments from the film. Mm, all right, let's see here. Uh, I, I. I I, I mean, obviously the 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 Dracula song scene, Dracula musical is, is th- again <laughs> to the point where I can remember all the die, die, I, I, die. I can't. And if I see Van Helsing, I swear I will slay him. <laughs> and her chanting Dracula musical. <laughs> And uh, the guy, well, the other the, guy at the bar who, yeah, like, right? halfway through the first like verse, I guess or whatever, yeah. he's like, ha, yeah. <laughs> so it's so <laughs> wonderfully cringe. It's so perfect. <laughs> Everything about the Dracula musical scene in the bar is just a ten and a half. What else? Uh, I mean, like everything with with. You know Jonah Hill and Paul Rudd and, and yeah. Bill Hader. I mean everything that they did. Well, okay, was so uh, Paul Rudd plays a surfer, surfer character. dude. Yeah, what's his name? I like the second time when he comes through. Um, and he's like, "Oh, hey man, you want uh, to try to get Kunu? Right? Is his name? Yeah, yeah. That's his name. Chuck or Kunu? Well, but they, he goes he goes back. The Kunu is what they call him, right? Yeah. Um, and when he's when he just starts casually saying, "The weather outside is weather," I sing that line so many times. So many times. I love me some Kunu, man. He is incredible. Um, what else? Mm, what else? Well, uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to figure what what I can finish as this top. If you three. If, if you are talking about the interactions between Jonah Hill and um, uh, Out of like, Snow yeah. specifically, so Out of Snow, who they ended up doing a spinoff. Uh, right. If yeah. you saw Get Him to the Greek, that was the same character from Forgetting Sarah Marshall. I did not see Getting. Uh, Russell Brand is Aldous Snow, and Jonah Hill uh, returns for Get Him to the Greek as well and is now working with Aldous huh. Snow. That relationship is developed. It's it's a it's a fine film. In fact, it has some really great moments. Um, it, it pales in comparison to Get Him to the Greek. It's, it's, there's no comparison, sorry, between uh, uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Mm. 
Forgetting Sarah Marshall's a 10. Get him to the Greek is a six and a half, seven. It's worth it. Like, you know, you should view it, but it's not gonna it's n- it's not a follow up to forgetting Sarah Marshall in any way. Um, but it's 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 not bad. It's not bad. It's a fine film. Um, the the indifferent the way that he would, you know, try to show up and drop his um, demo tape and uh, all of it, all of it wonderful. And then Aldous Snow going into song at like the on the beach, and inside of you, inside of you. Oh God. So great. Uh, what so was great. the the? I think it was the line that he said. Uh, oh, the, or like the very casual. Up, what's that? When he's like kind of breaking up with Sarah Marshall, Russell Brand. And oh, he's like, this oh is just God. a the. I, yeah. lo, it was a little holiday with Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> or when she gives him the shirt, the dinner scene when they all go to dinner together. Oh, my God. oh. oh. it's perfect. It's perfect. It's so wonderful. Um. All right. So. What else did you want to talk about from Forgetting Sarah Marshall? What else was on your list? Uh, I mean, Mila Kunis was was really great. First of all, in I prime mean, Mila Kunis, I I bring this up whenever I, I bring up um, when somebody says something stupid like "I'm done with the state flag." We see it everywhere. I always say there was a time in this country where we saw Mila Kunis everywhere, everywhere. We were all watching that '70s show every week. We saw she was on the cover of every magazine. She was it for a little while. And you know what? I never said to myself. We're seeing too much of Mila Kunis. You know why? Because she was wonderful. And this was peak Mila Kunis. This was Mila Kunis, uh, outstanding comedic actress and very attractive woman. All ra- I mean, like Mila Kunis had a run there that ve- even that that crummy um, uh, Friends with Benefits or whatever the one that she and Justin Timberlake did, which which is one of the most rewatchable films for being not in all at all a breathtaking film. Like it's not not captivating even a little bit, but yet every time it's on, you find yourself watching it because it's just it's so perfectly palatable because it was peak Mila Kunis at that point in her career. Um, this absolutely peak Mila Kunis. She was spectacular. Um, yeah, I mean Jason Siegel. Uh, I I don't know why I like didn't know to like I I have why I haven't done more stuff with him. Like, Jason why I haven't watched Siegel was like more, more stuff on the him. periphery. So if if you were a How I Met Your Mother fan, and a lot of people were really obsessed with How I Met Your Mother, I was not among them. I did not love How I Met Your Mother. Jason Siegel was more on the periphery of this group of the stars that kind of came out of the Judd Apatow franchise. Right. Was this so? It was like kind of like the Freaks and Geeks, like Freaks and Geeks is part of it, 100%, a hundred percent. But like bit. Seth Rogen was a much bigger star. Right. Okay. And Jonah Hill was a much bigger star. And this was uh, Knocked Up was part of this. Um, this is Forty was part of the. If you went over the Judd Apatow. It's funny because I ended up in a, a Twitter beef with Judd Apatow during the pandemic, which was hilarious because I, I, all I could keep saying was, dude, I effing love your films. Like, I'm obsessed with you. I'm just trying to point out how badly you botched Roger Staubach in um, what was the Pete Davidson movie called? King of, Stat- King yes. of Staten Island. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bill Burr's character was trying to inspire Pete Davidson, and it was like, by the time Roger Staubach was 24, he had graduated from West Point and served two tours. And I was like, he didn't go. He went to Navy. And so I ended up tweeting about it, and somehow John Apatow found out about it. Hey, man. And was, like, very defensive about, yeah, well, you know, the point was that he's a blowhard. And I was like, no, I said that in the tweet, but everything else he said in his, his spiel was true. That was the only thing he got wrong. If he had gotten four other things wrong, and this would have made sense that you were trying to, you know, make him a blowhard, that's the only thing he got wrong. And finally, he acquiesced and was like, yeah, you're right. But then he called like, called me an a-hole or something like that. All right, you're right, a-hole. <laughs> yeah, right? And I was like, God, you don't understand. I love you. I worship at the altar of Judd Apatow. And then he said, do you want to come on the um, show? And- oh, I never did. But he did uh, retweet. We were trying to, uh, that was before Mo had passed. And we were trying to, um, Jeremy had been trying to raise some money to buy Mo a new bed because we kind of knew that he was going to be in the bed for the rest of his life. And so... Uh, we got Judd Apatow to retweet the gotcha. uh, fundraiser for Moe's bed. So I did. We ended up f- making some peace uh, mm-hmm. when it came to yeah, that. Yeah, well, so I, like, I started like just kind of, I guess, right after I watched it, I somehow got like a, a YouTube video recommendation from a clip from Conan, and they were talking about uh, forgetting Sarah Marshall. And uh, Jason Siegel was talking about how 
Judd Apatow kind of wanted to. This was like the first movie I guess they did after Freaks and Geeks got canceled. So he wanted to show this that was these the first actors. One, really? I don't know if this was the first one or it sound right, but I'll, I'll or he, or all the movies that he did afterwards kind of wanted to show that these actors could be stars and stuff. And so that was I guess. Well, I mean, they turned. This, yeah, they I mean, turned but Jason Segel like wrote this movie. Like this is his. It's his, yeah, yeah. It's very much his baby. Yeah. Um, but Judd Apatow was part of, and th- again, it was the Judd Apatow era mm-hmm. is what this was. It was, I, I don't remember who all was responsible for Wedding Crasher. There was like a Will Ferrell, uh, Adam McKay. That's the name. There was a Will Ferrell, Adam McKay era that had come just a few years before this. That was, that was a movie review. Wedding Crashers. Wedding Crashers was, <laughs> okay, there we go. That was the third one. one. <laughs> that, the Adam McKay, Will Ferrell era was significant. A uh, 40-year-old version was the first of mm, okay. of the uh, – Judd Apatow had written oh, – heavy. I didn't realize he'd written Heavyweights, so that was a, d- a decade earlier. Remember, Heavyweights is a is a cult classic. It's Ben Stiller uh, leading a fat camp. It's it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, but the first of the, the Judd Apatow era was 40-year-old version, which uh, he was writer, director, and producer. And then it went in and a bunch of other films, Knocked Up, um, Pineapple Express, This is 40. Mm, okay. um, they don't have him listed as anything for, for Getting Sarah Marshall. Did he, was he? No, he was a producer. Yes, yeah, thank you. He was a producer for Getting, for, for getting Sarah Marshall. Yes. Anyway, sorry. Indeed. Anything else? Uh, I mean, no. I mean, I think we obviously I, I stand with the rest of the human population, and I can't wait for the full length feature Dracula, you know, puppet musical. Show. I have yeah, wondered for musical. a long time why they wouldn't go ahead and make a, a Dracula movie, like a Dracula musical movie. Like, I, I feel like Jason Siegel might have teased it at one point, the idea that 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 might come to fruition at some point, that there could be, but. I've never really heard anything that's followed up on that, and that makes me very sad because it would be really a joy for all of us if they could get to it at some point. Uh, your score I for forgetting Sarah Marshall. I think I'm going to go on your on the scale of uh, one to ten. I think I'm going to have to go with the solid. I'll go nine point four. I'll go nine point four. Okay, so nine point four. Here's what I would say. Yeah. Is that if you're saying that because like nothing can ever get a ten, I get it. Like I I sort of understand what you're saying. Like I can't. But I don't know. It, it is without flaw. It is perfection. The joy that you will find in watching Forgetting Sarah Marshall is unlike the joy that you have in watching just about anything. Um, it, would I would I elevate in in like modern comedies? Would I elevate Tommy Boy over? Maybe, but I don't think it's as well made of a film as Forgetting Sarah Marshall. I think as the comedy goes. Like it's it's just brilliant. It's a tour. It's a tour. It's a romp. It's all of that. But I don't think it's as brilliant of a film as Forgetting Sarah Marshall is. Super Bad is the most brilliant film of. It's just everything of every yeah. layer of it. But I don't compare it because coming of age movies have an inherent advantage in movie making because coming of age stories always like we all remember what it was like to be a certain age and we all find ourselves in those characters. So you get an inherent advantage when you're making a coming of age film. It's I, I talk about that a lot with, um, you know, I, I, my 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 idiot friend EDT doesn't love The Sandlot, and he's like, I just think there are better baseball movies. I'm like, because you're looking at it the wrong way. The Sandlot is a coming of age film where baseball is a character in the film. It's not a baseball movie. It's a baseball story in a coming of age film, and that's what makes it so brilliant. You're watching it the wrong way and in the wrong context. Forgetting Sarah Marshall is the burden of you can't associate with these characters. I mean, like you, you, we've been through breakups. Yeah, like, for, I like think that's, that's, that's still a very only, relatable. But that's the only part of it that we can associate yeah. with. None of us but were dating a famous actress. None of us. These, for the most part, none of these are are fully relatable characters. Super bad. They're all fully relatable characters, right? We all can relate with suburban. I mean, most of us can relate with suburban. Right. You know, kind of simplistic unexceptional but wanting to feel cool types of characters it's harder to relate and and there are more sti- there are more caricature characters kunu is a caricature character um jack mcbrayer's character is a caricature character there's more caricatures that are used extreme characters within forgetting sarah marshall but the point isn't that you're supposed to relate with them they're there to be slapstick comedy and that's what makes them so brilliant to me I, I get why you wouldn't want to give it a ten, but yeah. it's at and I least might not have high enough of a of an appreciation for Jason Siegel yet. That could be the problem too, just because I haven't seen what I need to. I want to see more. He's definitely now. I want to. I don't know that the story to me about this film is just Jason Siegel. I think that the story is how unrelenting the comedy. How at every turn, 
they're hitting you again within telling this story. And they're it's it's th- it's funny because we talk about Jack McBrayer. It's thirty rock ish without being like thirty rock. The pace was two hundred jokes a minute, right? Like that was the shtick of thirty rock was just you're never gonna have a moment where a joke isn't being made. This takes some of the concepts of constantly be hitting, constantly be delivering funny within the course of telling the story, and it's magical. So I would say it's more like a nine point eight. Okay. Like I would be closer to a, a true on ten. Because that's how I feel. I feel that strongly about forgetting Sarah Marshall, but I get it. I don't think it's a. Te- I don't think you're wrong. I think that's a fine score. I remember there was another movie that we reviewed. It was the Ethan Bembry. Uh, oh, can't hardly wait. Yes, yeah, I love wait. me some can't, can't hardly, hardly wait. wait. Should I rank? Do I need to rank all the uh, movies I reviewed? Oh, and you shared this out? Or, or well, I, mean, I don't know. Just like real quick, like there, I have five. Like okay, five. yeah. What were? Th- um, it was, so it was can't hardly wait. Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Tommy Boy, Road Trip, and Wedding Crash. Okay, so what are your rankings? I think I got to go Wedding Crashers. <sighs> wow. I don't know. Do you, did you write down what your scores were for all these? Uh, no, I you didn't. You should really go back I and... I should do that. Yeah, that, we should have that filed away. Keep, to make sure continuity. That, why don't we not give the answer until we know right, that right. we definitely... like a, Get your scores okay. and then reflect that appropriately, and you can remind me tomorrow. All, all right. right. What's all right. next on the list? Uh, on the list, I have Big Lebowski. I mean, in, in no particular order. Big Lebowski, The Aviator. I don't know why, why I wrote was that the one aviator down. Aviator on I don't know this why I wrote that one down. I don't feel like that. I feel like you had to have mentioned it. Did you, mean, space. did you mean to write down Catch Me If You Can? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I, the Tom Cruise? Ca- no. What? what? Which one am I thinking of? I don't know what just happened here, but my head hurts. Catch Me If You Can is Leonardo DiCaprio, and at ah, one yes. point he is a pilot in the film, but it's not The Aviator, which is the film about Howard Hughes, where he's just peeing in bottles. Maybe you wrote that down because I've referenced peeing in bottles before, and I've referenced Howard Hughes, and you were like, maybe I need to watch The Aviator. But it wouldn't fit with this necessarily. Catch me if you can. I feel very strongly about. So I would put catch me if you can on this list. So g- give me the another, list another again. Christopher Walken. Give me, give me the uh, list. Big Lebowski. Catch me if you can. Office Space. Liar, liar. Something about Mary. <sighs> the problem is we've done something about Mary before with a previous intern. That's mm-hmm. why I confused it. But I, I do think it's important enough that you should watch it. And these are different. And if you think of something else too. These are different types of comedies than mm. some of the ones that we've watched so far. These, some of the like Big Lebowski is a much smarter comedy. Catch me if you can is a is 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 a. Dr- I haven't seen I haven't seen Forty Year Old Virgin, so I don't know if that if we should add that. To we the should list watch Forty Year Old Virgin. It certainly fits with the. But why don't we Why don't we space them? Okay. Why don't, instead of doing another Apatow film, let's do read me the list one more time. Big Lebowski. Yeah. Catch me if you can. Office Space. I think you need to watch Lebowski. I did write Mystery Men down too. Oh, that's a that's a that's a selfish one for me. That's not a classic in any way, but it should be. It's a brilliant film. Let's do Lebowski next. Okay. It's a Coen Brothers film. It's a very different type of film, right? Like, it is not it is not slapstick in any way, but it is beloved to the point where I legitimately am an ordained Dudist priest, which you will understand after you watch Big Lebowski. Um, it's a movie that a lot of people care a great deal about. Let's do Lebowski next. All right, that'll be up next for Griffin's movie reviews. Right. Sounds good. I also like... I'd really like to dress these segments up by you pulling like a clip. Oh, okay. All right. I'd, I'd really like, like for you to say, this was my favorite scene in the movie. Let's pull it and let's play the clip okay. during the segment. All right. I'd All like right. to, I've realized we could dress this up more. You're trying to learn radio, right? You want to be a big radio star moving forward. So let's do better radio. Let's pull a clip or two from all these. And again, you'll probably be able to find these scenes on mm. YouTube somewhere, yeah. so it shouldn't be all that hard. Uh, but let's pull a couple of clips of your favorite scenes in some of these films when we review them, all right? Yeah. Very right. good. Sounds good. Griffin's Sounds Movie good. Reviews. Thank you. Appreciate Getting it. Getting Sarah Marshall. Next, let's get a tidbit. Tidbit is brought to you today by your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines, so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect your unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. Mike Yastrzemski hit another walk-off yesterday for the Giants, and this one went into McCovey Cove. He now has two of the four walk-off splashes all time into McCovey Cove. Mm. Yeah. Do you think you can name the other two? Uh, Barry Bonds, I'm just going to guess. It was Barry Bonds. 2003, he had a walk-off <laughs> into McCovey Cove. Uh, and this one, Travis Ishikawa. No, not Travis Ishikawa. Uh, he's still on the team, but he did it in 2014. 2014? Yeah. He's still on the team? I know. I was surprised this guy was still on the, was on the team in 2014. Brandon Belt? No, other he's Brandon. Not. Brandon Crawford. Brandon Crawford. Yeah, I didn't Brandon Crawford in oh, April okay. 2014. Right. Hit, a, hit a walk-off splash. I guess you have to be a left-hander. I guess I do have yeah. to. Yeah. Well, Brandon Belt is a lefty, right? Yeah, he is. Oh, yeah, he's, Belt's a lefty. He's, right, just yeah, on, yeah. he's just yeah. on the Blue Jays now. Yeah. Not 
really contributing much. Was that it? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, with uh, so uh, Corbin Carroll now has 20 home runs and 21 stolen bases in his first 102 career games played. He is the second fastest player in the AL NL era uh, to reach 20, 20 and 20 in uh, you know in his first you know career game. So the fastest player did in 97 games. Do you think you, do you think you know who it, who it is? 20 er- and Eric 20. Davis. Not Eric Davis. Uh, I I'm he I is don't a current player. Is it Julio Rodriguez? Not Julio Rodriguez. Acuna, not Acuna. He's a current player. Uh, Trout, not Trout. Tatis, yes, Fernando yeah. Tatis, ninety-seven games, fastest player ever to reach twenty and twenty in his career. Okay, and that kind of leads me into, or also actually, I'll do this to Luis Arise when he's the fourth player to have three five-hit games in a single month. He joins. You know, I, you probably won't get him. Ty Cobb in July. Well, he's, a, he's a good one. Yeah, well, he was the one you might be able to get. George Sisler. Ah, that was my next guess. He was in August of uh, 1921. Ah. Three five hit games okay. in a calendar month. And then Dave Winfield. Okay, well, these are all really good players. Yeah. In fairness, this is not – you're saying it like it's super random. These are all great yeah, players. Yeah, they were, but it yeah. was going to be hard. I, guess I'm not, I wouldn't have been the first three that I would have guessed. But. Uh, and staying on the kind of combined home run stolen base, I saw this stack going around over the weekend, and I liked it a lot. Uh, I want to see if you guys can name uh, the top ten players in 2023 with the most combined home runs and stolen bases. There is an Oriole who rounds out the top ten. Most combined home runs and all right. stolen bases. Cedric Mullins. Cedric Mullins is not the Oriole. That is in the top ten. And Jorge awesome. Mateo. Jorge Mateo. Are you serious? Rounds Just because he has so many stolen bases. He has, has twenty six combined because he has twenty stolen bases, six homers. Okay, sure. Um, so then I feel like we can go with guys that just have hit a lot of home runs too, because mm-hmm. they you could. So Otani. Otani is fourth on this list. He does not how have the most combined though. How many? Uh, the so Otani. Oh, I'm almost top ten. Top ten. Yeah. Otani is thirty four right. combined. A- Acuna. Acuna is number one, 45 combined. He has 30 stolen bases and 15 home runs. How about Aaron Judge? Aaron Judge not in the top ten. Might have been if he had yeah, not if gotten hurt. Healthy. He has a 22 combined. Um, how about – man, this actually is harder than I thought it was because I'm like listing the guys that have had a lot of home All runs. Right, well, Corbin Carroll. Corbin Carroll is indeed oh, in the yeah, top three. He has 35. We knew that. <laughs> yes. 16 homers, 19 stolen bases on this season. Semyon? He also leads the NL in slugging percentage right now. Corbin Carroll. He might win the MVP. Bobby Witt. Bobby Witt is an excellent guess, and he is in the top five. Okay. 34 combined home runs and stolen I'm bases. I think of guys that have stolen bases. About Marcus Semyon? Marcus Semyon is a good guess, but he is not in the top ten. Then Adolis Garcia. Uh, not Adolis Garcia. There are no Texas Rangers. Julio Rodriguez. Julio Rodriguez. Should have guessed that earlier. One ahead of Jorge Mateo. A Rosarena. A Rosarena. There are two Rays, but neither are Randy Rosarena. Franco? Wander Franco has 32 combined. 24 Yandy stolen Diaz bases. then? He doesn't uh, steal bases, but. Yeah, not Yandy Diaz. Uh, uh, Josh, Josh, Josh Lowe, Lowe, who, I mean, I don't know he where he talking came about from. talking about with Brian yeah. Anderson. Or, uh, if we had not br- if season. Brian Anderson hadn't brought him up earlier, I would have never <laughs> guessed Josh Lowe. And I'm not kidding. I was not He's aware. I actually looked it up as Brian uh, Brian Anderson was talking about Josh it. Lowe? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, he's an unknown. Um, uh, Mookie here. Betts. Mookie Betts is an excellent guess, but he is just outside. So we need two more side. guys. The correct, yes. Christian Yelich? Not Christian Yelich. But Altman from the Dodgers. Not out. Altman. There's an Oakland A who is number oh, two. Oh, uh, the rookie. Ru- is it Ruiz? Yes. What's yeah. his first name? Uh, Estuary yes, Ruiz. There you go. Well, not Estuary. Estuary. Estuary okay. Ruiz. He has 30, 36 stolen bases and one home run, and he is second in the l- wow. in the league in combined home runs wow, and stolen nice. bases. So we need one more? Yes, you do. Mm. Tied but with Jorge Mateo. Volpe? Volpe is a good guess because he's still yeah, he's at 9 and 15, but he is outside the top 10. Not Buxton. He doesn't stay healthy enough. Uh, Jose Ramirez. Not Jose Ramirez. I think he slowed down a little bit. Okay. Uh, Arias. Uh, no, not oh. Arias. He doesn't steal bases, or really hit a home runs either. All right, well. <laughs> he just hits. He just uh, gets no. hits. Austin Riley. Guy not Austin stinks. Riley. All right, give us something. Uh, we talked about him. Uh, J T. Romuto. In the bu- in the earlier tidbit. 
Tatis. Tatis. Yes. Oh. Fernando Tatis. Oh. Which like, kind of is, you know, because he was suspended for all of April. Yeah, that's why it didn't come so, to mind. But he is already uh, tied with Mateo. Yeah, he's already got like 14 or 15 home runs. Yes. And then Tyro Estrada for the Giants also has 26. Going to be an all-star. Tied at that, like, 10th spot. Speaking of the Giants, um, oh, I'll tell you about it in a second when I end the show. We have a giant scheduled to join us tomorrow. Hey, Pressbox is offering new sports bettors the best sign-up bonuses and promos from the seven legal online sports books. Go to PressBoxOnline.com slash offers right now and get offers like $150 in bonus bets from DraftKings after you place your first $10 bet or up to $1,250 in bonus bets from Caesars. Time is limited to get the best offers from all of the sports books. Go to PressBoxOnline.com slash offers and sign up today. Here's what's coming up tonight, totally tubular-wise. Orioles raise first of a short two-game set. Kyle Bradish, Tyler Glasnow, just after 6.30 on Masson 2. Um, why would it be on Masson 2? Oh, man, I'm not even going to If the it. Nationals are at I home, know, is it the big three? But it's not that easy anymore. Like, yeah. it used to be that simple to figure out. It's not that simple to figure out any longer. It's it's very complicated. Um, I'm not going to go into any more baseball because you'll be watching the Orioles. ESPN College World Series this afternoon. TCU or Roberts, that's an elimination game. Oh, yeah. At 2 o'clock. And then Tennessee LSU tonight at 7 o'clock. That's an elimination game as well. Right? These are both elimination games. Yes. Because right? LSU lost yeah, to Wake Forest last night. Yes. Last night. Yeah, you're right. So these are both elimination games. Who's LSU playing? Tennessee. Oh, 7 o'clock. Uh, NBA TV, Atlanta Dream, Dallas Wings at 8, Connecticut Sun, Seattle Storm at 10, CBS Sports Network, Minnesota Lynx, LA Sparks at 10, MLB Network for coverage of the Draft Combine at 1, uh, Euro qualifying, Iceland and Portugal at 245. They should just let Iceland in because they're so cool. Why do they come qualify? God, the Euro is so much better when Iceland's involved and everybody's doing the whatever that thing is called. Is the skull? The, the sk- skull, yeah, the yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, a Fox Sports 2, a friendly between Germany and Colombia at 245, and then some Gold Cup qualifiers. I swear to God, these are countries, one of these countries I had absolutely never heard of before. Tonight at 920, French Guiana, which I have heard of, is taking on St. Kitts and Nevis. Both of them? Yeah, it's always unfair when you have to play both. <laughs> Say prestigious. USA Network tonight for WWE NXT at 8. Some non-sports highlights? Mm, not really. America's Got Talent on NBC, and 85 South did a comedy special. Uh, that is on out on Netflix. Uh, what is eighty five? They're like a gr- like a, a, a hip hop group. If you say yeah. so. Uh, right. Rich Homie Quan is performing. Ah, you know, okay. Yeah, it, so he is. I met him one time. Rich Homie Quan at an really? Ole Miss football game. How about was, that? Pre game. Wow. He was wow. a really nice guy. Well, there you go. I uh, I have no rich. I have nothing to add <laughs> to the conversation. That's it. That is it. There yeah. Slow night tonight. Uh, Carson, where are you on social? At social. Uh, at social media. Geez. At social media. At Carson, yeah. where on he social? Is the media. social media. At Carson, I Mayer. am social media. Uh, give him a follow, and uh, Carson's working. We need to spread out the TikTok more. I, we got to have that okay. conversation. Okay. We had three videos go up in one day, which really makes it hard to get traction. And then the yes. rest of the week, we had nothing else going on. We just got to talk about it. That's okay. all. Got to talk about it. Uh, thanks today to Mike Bordick. Thanks as well to Brian Anderson. We'll get it up in the greatest hits section of the. Oh my God, it's so good. Tab at GlennClarkRadio.com. As we mentioned, uh, Lamont Wade from the San Francisco Giants, Baltimore native and Maryland alum. I remember the last time we talked to Lamont Wade, he was raving to me about how his career was made by Matt Swope, who is the new Maryland baseball coach. So we're going to have Lamont Wade tell us a little bit more about Maryland's new baseball coach. Um, and we'll talk about this the excellent season he's having. Also, tomorrow, mm. Mike Boddicker, we're going to continue our celebration of the 40th anniversary of the uh, Orioles winning the 1983 World Series. Mike Boddicker joins us tomorrow and stuff and things. things. Okay. Thanks, everybody, at Pressbox, all of our great sponsors and partners, including Live Casino and Hotel Maryland, Glory Days Grill, Royal Farms, Costas Inn, All-American Lacrosse, the Baltimore Orioles, Birdland Sports, your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. Thanks to Griffin at Griffin underscore Bass. Follow us, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Glenn Clark Radio. Have a great Tuesday evening. Go Birds. Duke sucks.